Thank you very much, Lanier Middle School, and thank you, parents, for sharing your children's talents with us tonight. In order to comply with Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it's necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on December 15, 2016, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Do I have a motion? Moved by Mrs. Schultz, seconded by um, Ms. Hines. All those in favor, raise your hand. Um, Hines, Palchek, Huff, Schultz, Strauss, Evans, Moon, uh, Darnett Kofax, McElveen. All those opposed, all those abstaining. Mr. Wilson abstains and that motion passes. A few announcements before we begin tonight's meeting. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda or any agenda item that's being discussed tonight, that information is on the table at the in a, by the um, auditorium entrance. Tonight's agenda is available by going to school board on the FCPS homepage and selecting board docs under upcoming school board meetings. The meeting is also being streamed live online. Select school board from the full menu then click on the Watch Live button on the School Board Meetings webpage. Please turn off or silence your cell phone. Ms. McLaughlin and Mrs. Corbett Sanders will be absent this evening. I now call on Ms. Chu for announcements. Thank you, Most Honorable Chair. Um, in the new year, the National Mentoring Month will take place during January. National Mentoring Month highlights mentoring and the positive impact it can have on young lives. This month-long outreach program focuses national attention on the need for mentors, as well as how each of us, individuals, businesses, government agencies, schools, faith communities, and nonprofits can work together to increase the number of mentors and assure brighter futures for our young people. Positive relationships between mentors and their mentees have been shown to encourage young people to stay in school, achieve personal growth, and believe in themselves, living up to their full potential. National Mentoring Month marks its 16th anniversary in 2017 with the theme, Mentoring in Real Life, encouraging citizens to volunteer as mentors. And that is all. Thank you, Ms. Chu. The next order of business is citizen participation. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes. The school board would not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school officials. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Please be mindful that we often have young children here in the audience, as well as sometimes watching at home, so please make your comments appropriate for all ages. Thank you for your cooperation and thank you for all of those who came out to speak to us tonight. Tonight there are 10 citizens who have signed up to address the board and the first is Helen Graff to be followed by Eric Davenport to be followed by Bethany Cosma. Uh, Ms. Graff. Is Ms. Graff here? Okay. And if those would, uh, of you would uh, please move down uh, when I call your name so you can be ready. Uh, Mr. Davenport and Ms. Cosma. Uh, Ms. Cosma. Um, is Helen, oh, you're Ms. Graff? I see, all right. And would you state your names and uh, uh, after you're finished, please let the clerk know your name. Okay, uh, my name is Adam Graff. And uh, this is my son Isaiah and my daughter Alexis. And I uh, just wanted to uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, the decision for my family and I to move to Fairfax County several years ago was significantly influenced by the level of public education that was available here. Um, searching online, Fairfax County had a pretty good reputation. Um, as a father, as a parent of three children, two of which are school age, and one that will be in a few years, um, you know, a robust school program was a must for us. So we are very thankful to the school district, uh, the school board, um, definitely for the hard work and the dedication in helping our students, you know, achieve their full potential. Student success is, after all, the first goal of the IGNITE plan, and that is what I'm here to speak to you tonight about. 
And uh, first two overarching strategies. Um, the first overarching strategy in, um, talks about instructional practices will be enhanced to support students in achieving their full potential. It is an honorable strategy, but recent actions by the school board, I feel, don't align with that strategy. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about including gender identity into the non-discrimination policy 1450. Uh, this decision was under-researched and it was a rash action um, to fulfill a political agenda and not the student body's uh, full potential in mind. Um, not enough research has been done in what the full impact of um, you know, teaching and exposing young children, impressionable children to uh, question their gender identity. Uh, unknown unknown long-term effects foster lifelong mental confusion. Um, statistics have shown that a lot of transgender uh, participants um, after their procedures uh, start to regret their decision. Um, and uh, additionally, if physical facts such as your biological gender at birth um, become questionable, then what about non-physical aspects, uh, mental aspects such as morals and ethics? They're even more questionable than physical aspects. Um, what, what further complicates this is the graphic, verbal, and visual uh, de descriptions that are being used in FLE. And in fact, today they taught FLE in my son's school. And um, obviously we opted out on that, but afterwards, obviously all the kids were very much abuzz with uh, what was going on in the classroom during FLE. And some of their words were disgusting, torture, unbearable, you know, I find it um, pretty interesting, wow, pretty interesting that material that is suitable for a classroom, if it was shown in a movie theater, would be rated R. So thank you for this time. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to my other points. Next. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing your children with us. Uh, Mr. Davenport, to be followed by Bethany Cosma, to be followed by Hope uh, Kaziak. Hello. My name is Eric Davenport. This kind of looks like the UN here, man. Um, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Uh, my name is Eric Davenport. I'm a private violin teacher in Reston, and I'd like to talk about two subjects which pertain to student success. I have a student in the orchestra program at Langston Hughes Middle, and I've heard nothing but positive feedback from my students and his parents about his teacher, his experience and his experience in orchestra. I congratulate Fairfax County for offering orchestra to our children, and I hope you continue the orchestra program. I don't have to tell you that uh, music and orchestra and band is uh, a, a real marker of student success in schools. I have concerns, however, about the subject of sex and sexuality being taught in Fairfax County. The family life program and the health programs being offered at all levels in Fairfax are teaching inappropriate and even unethical topics to our children. Contraception, homosexuality, gender identity are being introduced in seventh grade. I guess it was fourth grade. I, I don't know what this man was alluding to. This is not only inappropriate, but it is psychologically abusive. Our children should be kept innocent of these topics, as marriage is the only ethical outlet for sexuality. The explosive, complicated, and emotional topic of sexuality and deviant sexuality should not be taught in schools. These topics are in the parents' jurisdiction only. In the Family Life Program, sexuality as a spectrum is being introduced in eighth grade. Not only is this a radical fringe view of sexuality, uh, but it has no place in school. Teaching this at school gives legitimacy to this fringe view of sexuality that it does not deserve. My friends, this amounts to psychological abuse. 
If I have misunderstood the family life and health programs at Fairfax County Schools, please forgive me. If I am accurate about them, then I beg you, rethink your curriculum to not only align itself with ethics and common decency, but with reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bethany Cosma to be followed by Hope uh, Koziak to be followed by Meg Kilgannon. Bethany Koza here, Kozma. Uh, good evening, uh, I'm John Murray, uh, speaking on behalf of parentandchild.org. Parentandchild.org is a group of parents whose children attend or graduated from Fairfax County Public Schools. Our group did an evaluation of the entire FLE curriculum and published the results on our website, parentandchild.org. I'm speaking to you tonight because the current FLE program creates obstacles to student success. A revised family life education program could make tremendous strides towards creating student success. What are the problems in the FLE curriculum? Some FLE lessons are scientifically inaccurate or seriously incomplete. Some FLE lessons encourage behaviors which can result in serious emotional, psychological, or physical consequences. A revised FLE curriculum by itself would be a student success strategy by giving students scientifically correct and complete information and discouraging behaviors with adverse physical and emotional consequences. Is there a better student success strategy than providing accurate information and promoting healthy behavior? What are the problems, where are the problems in the FLE curriculum? Please take a look at the parentandchild.org website, select view clickable chart, and then you can click the dot for each lesson on the chart to get you a brief review of the lesson and the reason it was graded green, yellow, or red. I hope you'll take a few minutes sometime this week and see what we have to say. I hope parents of Fairfax County students will do the same. The most basic student success strategy is to provide students accurate information and to encourage healthy behaviors and discourage unhealthy ones. Is the current FLE program entirely without merit? No, there are some good and accurate lessons in the FLE program. You'll find our chart acknowledges such lessons. I hope the FLE program can be changed to promote student success strategies by providing scientifically correct and complete information and encourage healthy behaviors while discouraging unhealthy ones. Thank you. Hope Koziak to be followed by Meg Kilgannon to be followed by Kathleen Gillette Mallard. Good evening, my, hope, my name is Hope Wojcik. I am a Fairfax County resident, a graduate of Oakton High School, and a mother of four amazing boys. Three of my boys are currently enrolled in FCPS. This evening I would like to address the agenda item related to student success strategies. As a mother of several school-aged children, I would suggest that an extremely important, if not the most important element of student academic success is the engagement, involvement, and support of parents. However, during my years as a parent of FCPS students, I have repeatedly felt that the school system, and in particular this board, does not want parents involved in the education of our children or to hear our opinions, especially opinions that differ from your own. For example, you permit only 10 speakers at your business meeting and allow them only three minutes to share their thoughts on topics of your choosing. In addition, I have written many emails to the school board sharing my thoughts on matters that are important to me and my family. At best, they are met with an auto reply thanking me for my email. Most go unacknowledged entirely. During my time spent attending or watching online the school board meetings, I have witnessed board members and our superintendent telling outright lies to parents, as well as lying by omission. In one circumstance, FCPS was able to accomplish both in one single email. On May 18th, 2015, FCPS sent out an email to the, from the superintendent to all parents related 
to recommendation, recommended changes in the family life education curriculum. This email told parents, quote, many of the instructional objectives of FLE now meet the Virginia Department of Education general health standards of learning, and as such, no longer have an opt-out option. This statement was actually not true. A friend of mine chose not to simply take the superintendent at her word. Instead, she spent her precious free time comparing Fairfax County's FLE curriculum to Virginia's FLE curriculum. What she found was that the two were very comparable, and, FLE, and the Fairfax FLE actually goes above and beyond what is required by the state. In fact, over 85% of the FLE objectives that this board voted to move from FLE to health in June of 2015 aligned better with Virginia's FLE curriculum than it did with Virginia's health curriculum. Yet Superintendent Garza and this board told parents otherwise, subsequently eliminating the ability of parents to opt their children out of classroom discussions on these topics. Over the last year, it has been brought to your attention that required reading for FCPS high school students includes sexually explicit material and obscene language. Yet FCPS still sees no need to notify parents that their students will be reading such books, allowing the parents to decide if it is appropriate for their child. These are just a few recent examples of the way FCPS has disregarded and disrespected parents as the primary educators and decision makers for their children. If you desire to have successful students, you must first have parents who are engaged and involved with your schools and supportive of the plans you wish to implement. Ignoring, undermining, and lying to parents while pushing your political agendas on their families is a foolish way to accomplish your goal. Thank you. Meg Kilgannon. Good evening. My name is Meg Kilgannon, and I hear, I'm here to represent concerned parents and educators of Fairfax County. We're a diverse group of parents who came together after witnessing the shocking disregard by, for parents by some on the school board during the passage of policy 1450. People of goodwill can disagree on policy issues, and I'm sure some of you do believe that you're helping children with policies like 1450, but our membership strongly disagrees with that. We believe, and scientific evidence supports our belief, that policies like 1450 are dangerous to all students and they particularly Ms. harm Kilmana, the you very. Do know that you signed I signed up to. Up to I'm getting to, to that. Uh, Hang on. Discuss the mid-year budget In effect, reviews. 1450 is especially harmful to the confused students you're trying to help. But I came here tonight to talk about the budget, because parents and citizens are taking a closer look at everything the school board is doing. Uh, we're seeing more things, and we're liking less and less. Case in point: the budget, your 2.8 billion dollar budget. It's hard to even fathom the amount of money that is. The first billion dollars would circle the earth four times. The second, second billion dollars would make a stack 68 miles high. And the remaining 800 million would cover three square miles of Fairfax County. So you can understand how unbecoming it is to voters, your constant poor mouthing. We just all had our taxes raised last year, and yet you spent all fall telling us why we needed to pass the meals tax, because the $2.8 billion just isn't enough. Even though the Democrat nominee won Fairfax County with 63% of the vote, your meals tax failed 55 to 45%. That's a resounding defeat. The freewheeling spending must stop. Let's decide what we simply must have and re to return excellence in education to Fairfax County. Do we really need to write our own K-12 family life education program, for example? What if we just taught sex education using the Virginia SOQs? That would cost less money in staff time and curriculum development and leave more time for instruction in core curricula subjects and especially SOL subjects. Our current FLE program uses phrases like sex assigned at birth and if abstinence acute in includes abstaining from and sex, uh, th we probably would be better off with just the SOQs. So do we really need to produce our own youth survey? How many staffers at FCPS and at the county are working on that every day? What are their salaries and benefits costing taxpayers? Never mind the additional spending you dream up based on the results of the survey. Isn't it, is it really necessary to do that? We could live without it for five to 10 years and then reassess if it's really necessary. 
Parents want higher teacher salaries for our hardworking educators. We want smaller class sizes. We elected you to make that happen, not to let boys in the girls' locker room. So we challenge you to do better and to be wise with the $2.8 billion you so generously have. Kathleen Gillette Mallard to be followed by Omar Abdelreem, Rehem, to be followed by having, uh, Kevin Hickerson. Ms. Gillette Mallard, is um, Ms. Gillette Mallard here? All right, um, Omar Abdelreem. How close did I get? I was very close, okay. very close. Usually most people don't get that close, <laughs> so thank you. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Omar Abdel Rahim. I am a Muslim American and a disabled veteran of the U.S. Navy, and I have three children that attend Fairfax County Public Schools. And I came here to address the meeting agenda item, creating student success strategies. Uh, in an effort to put my kids in an environment that will give them the best opportunity for success, I wanted to come here and give some insight and some feedback. I attended my kids' sixth grade ceremony, my twins, I have twins, and what I realized was there was twice the amount of time spent and twice the amount of awards for music than there was academics. And I kept on asking myself, what is the message? And this is a school that is an AAP school that boasts high academic standards and results. So I wanted to understand uh, and also wanted to uh, have the board evaluate and take a look at that and say, what is music take precedence over uh, academics? And I understand that music and art can be important, may be important for nurturing student development and creating well-rounded people, but not at the expense of obtaining a basic level of fundamental education used to survive, thrive, compete, succeed in an ever-increasing globally comp competitive world. Is this why our kids are having a hard time competing with international students from third world countries? Why can't we use best practices and learn? In my meeting with one of the deans of UC Berkeley, it came out that more than double the academic scholarships were going to internationally educated students, private school students, or students with a heavy international background. After all this, with all that being said, we are now discussing another wrinkle into the fabric of our student success with the advent of a very distracting policy that would further distance our children from being able to compete with international students and further education. Policy 1450 creates a hostile learning environment for Islamic faith followers. It also creates an environment where students are now thinking about things they never had to think about before, such as going to the bathroom. This policy would violate the natural rights of females and would require an increased attention and focus to the school system in order to maintain a safe learning environment which would increase costs, which now we're talking about budget, and once again take away from the focus of making our students successful. If the aim is to decrease the discrimination, then let's handle a much larger issue in the mass majority of your schools in protecting our Muslim students. 5% of the county is Muslim and there are approximately 10,000 Muslim students in Fairfax County Public Schools. And it's clear from the media that there is a public discrimination against Muslims. And I have heard from my kids' teachers about my kids being verbally and even physically abused because of religion. During my term as a leader of a Muslim community, I have spoken to many Muslim youths, and it's come to my attention that the majority of them were discriminated against in their schools. If discrimination is the concern, why aren't we talking about this? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Hickerson to be followed by Rachel Baxter to be followed by Paul McClemens. Good evening, Superintendent Lockhart, Chairman Evans, FCPS School Board, and staff. I'm Kevin Hickerson, President of the Fairfax Education Association, and I'm here to speak uh, about the mid-year budget review. We are happy that the district was able to find savings, and we trust that those savings will be allocated responsibly in the upcoming months. A few things of particular note. When it comes to savings, particularly for health care, any savings realized on the employee side should be conti continue to keep the health care costs low and increase comp employee compensation. In short, be used to help the employees from whence these savings came, rather than be returned to the general budgetary pot. Regarding differentiated pay, FEA would expect to be consulted as the school board explores this option. 
We certainly need to do more to recruit and retain the best possible staff. But one-time bonuses are a Band-Aid fix for a long-term compensation problem. We have a recruitment issue, but this issue is caused by the departure of some of our best and most experienced staff moving from neighboring jurisdiction to, to neighboring jurisdictions with better compensation packages. We particularly worried about the concept of creating a tiered workforce if differentiated pay went beyond simply hire, simple hiring bonuses. The same concerns exist around ERFC, where many of the potential changes under discussion could create this kind of tiered workforce, where employees are treated differently and have different compensation or retirement models based on what year they were hired. As you know, FC, FEA stands opposed to any changes to ERFC that would weaken our retirement, but we are particularly opposition to changes that would create disparities between FCPS staff. Finally, FEA is grateful to have been get included again on the budget task force, and we remain happy to continue to work with the school board and community at large to find the budget savings to create the least harm to our students and our employees. And with that, I give you the gift of another minute of time. Happy holidays to you all. We'll see you in the new year. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hickerson. Uh, Rachel Baxter. Good evening. Uh, from my kindergarten classroom at Hunt Valley Elementary School all the way to the choir room at West Springfield High School, I was born, bred, and educated in Fairfax County. Saying I was from Fairfax County was a badge of honor that I proudly wore. I was always told that Fairfax County Public Schools had a reputation for excellence, and people I met outside the county reiterated this belief when they learned that's where I was from. My mom worked at my high school while I was a student there, and this offered me a unique opportunity to get the, to know the staff, not just as educators and role models, but as family friends. I built relationships elsewhere in the county too. Mrs. Strauss, you may not remember me, uh, but I had a picture of you and several of my friends hanging on my wall that was taken at the Kennedy Center Cappies Gala when I was 15 years old. Um, Cappies was such a positive force in my life, and to this day, I'm grateful for you for creating a program that made high school theater nerds feel like Tony Award-winning performers. Uh, when I was in the 11th grade, I sang the national anthem at a school board meeting with the West Springfield Madrigals, and remember being introduced by you, Mr. Moon. You all may not remember me, but I feel like we go way back. <laughs> um, once I knew I wanted to go into education, I could not think of a better school district to be in than the one that had left such a positive, lasting impression on me. I did my research and looked into other school districts in the region as well, and was disheartened to learn that pay for teachers in Fairfax County is much lower than other districts in the region. How could this be so, with all I knew about FCPS being the best of the best? Still, I substituted with Fairfax County and decided that it could still be a home for me as a teacher. The one thing I kept hearing from everyone who I sought advice from was, yeah, it's pretty disappointing that teachers in Arlington make so much more money, but at least the benefits are great, especially the retirement. It's my first year as a teacher, and while I have loved every second in the classroom, I am disheartened at what I'm hearing out of the classroom. Based on discussions at previous school board meetings, these great retirement benefits are in risk of being phased out for newer, non-vested teachers like myself and eliminated entirely for prospective new teachers to the county. While many things go into making a school district successful, it is the people and specifically the teachers who are the backbone of the system. They are the ones who made my education memorable and continue to enrich my life as trusted friends and experienced colleagues. How do you expect to recruit new, young, top tier teachers when they have every reason to go elsewhere? How can Fairfax County maintain its reputation of excellence when there's no incentive for the best teachers to come work for Fairfax County? These teachers that FCPS needs to recruit don't want a signing bonus. They want good retirement benefits and competitive pay. The school board must consider the long lasting ramifications of these decisions. It makes me wonder if the same caliber of educators whose classrooms I had the privilege of being in during my formative years will still be there in the future if the school board does not see the value in paying them what they are worth and investing in their retirement. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McClemens. Superintendent Lockhart. 
Chairman Evans, Student Representative Ms. Chu, and esteemed school board members. My name is Paul McClemens and I'm the president of the Fairfax County Federation of Teachers. I represent FCPS educators who chose to come to Fairfax County Public Schools because this is the best school system in the country. I'm here tonight to address the mid-year budget review. There are two concerns that my members continue to communicate to FCFT and I would like you to know about those concerns. The first concern is the proposed changes to ERFC. FCFT understands the decision has not been made yet by the school board, but FCPS employees are concerned. FCFT also understands that the cost to continue this program at the current rate can't continue. However, it is the hope of FCFT that you will reconsider some of the choices and cuts to ERFC. Although many of FCPS's newer employees who have under five years of experience may not understand the impact of those proposed changes, they will when the time gets closer to retirement and that money is no longer there. If the school board decides to follow the trend that private sector businesses have went to and defined contributions, we will lose the greatest benefit that attracts our new teachers to come to Fairfax County Public Schools and then stay here, ERFC. FCFT urges the school board to stop looking at what everyone else is doing around us and start looking at what FCPS is doing right and keep ERFC as is. Changing the interest rating from 5% to 4% for all employees is a change that would mean savings to FCPS, but once again, a huge cut to FCPS employees' livelihood over the lifespan of their service here in FCPS. A 1% change may not seem like a lot on paper, but that percentage adds up over time for FCPS employees. Time that our FCPS employees have given to the system and time that they deserve to have credited to them in full when they retire from FCPS. The second concern I am addressing tonight is substitute pay. FCFT continues to hear every day from its members that our teachers and administrators are having a hard time filling substitute positions. FCFT understands that there are substitutes going through orientation right now and will be available soon. But are those the same quality substitute teachers that we used to rely upon to make sure that our lessons were followed when we aren't at school that day? FCFT hears, its members, hears from its members that when a specialist sets up their own substitute for the day and they are going to be absent, that same substitute either cancels the job and no-shows or the substitute gets pulled to fill a classroom teacher's absence. Many teachers and staff members are not taking needed time off to recover from illness because they can't find a substitute. Once again, FCPS looked at the other surrounding jurisdictions when making the decision to cut substitute pay for this year's budget. Instead of looking at what FCPS does best, provide quality substitute teachers who take pride in what they do because they are being compensated and paid for working for the best school system in the country. FCFT urges the school board to make the right decision and restore the substitute pay for great qualified substitute teachers who can read a lesson plan, keep order and discipline, and follow the daily schedule set up by the classroom teacher. Thank you. Thank you. We now go to item 3.02, FY 2018 to uh, 2022 capital improvement budget and, uh, program, and I call on Dr. Lockhart for the introduction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Jeff Plattenberg, who will be sharing the capital improvement pr plan with us. As you know, the CIP provides a look uh, into five years of student enrollment projections and capacity. As you'll see, we continue to face some challenges where student enrollment in certain areas of the county uh, is outpacing capacity. So uh, Mr. Plattenberg will present uh, to you areas of new construction, capacity enhancements, renovations, and site acquisition. So I would ask that you please welcome Jeff Plattenberg and any of his team he's brought along with him. I'm sure we'll reference them at some point here uh, for the presentation of the CIP. Jeff? Well, thank you, Dr. Lockhart, members of the school board. Um, indeed, I'd like to recognize Mr. Kevin Sneed, who's with me this evening, without which the capital improvement program wouldn't really exist at the level of excellence that it purely does. He does simply an outstanding job. As you, as you may know, the capital improvement program is but one of a cadre of elements serving as the blueprint for student success in Fairfax County Public Schools. This, coupled with a portrait of a graduate, the FCPS strategic plan Ignite, and the four strategic goals, including goal one that's gonna be presented this evening regarding student success. That, coupled with the budget, the Fairfax County Comprehensive Plan as amended, serve as a strong foundation for the direction in which we're headed. 
It's kind of important to note that since the 2008-2009 student membership in Fairfax County Public Schools has grown by an average of 2,400 students each year, sometimes more, sometimes less, but on average 2,400, for a total membership growth of more than 21,000 students, Arlington County Public Schools has approximately 25,278 students in their 2015 uh, published documents, and the City of Alexandria Public Schools, September 2016, shows an enrollment of 15,506. So simply put, it's quite amazing the rapid pace of growth that we continue to have overall, even though you'll see that we're leveling off a little bit. I have about 10 slides I'm gonna go through this evening, uh, not including the cover and close slide and then be open to any questions you may have. So the student enrollment to, for 2016-2017, we have an increased enrollment during this period of time a net increase of 1,368 students. You'll see that we, uh, last year, our increase was 240 some students, but we had a moderate to slight decrease in centers and alternative programs. Our total enrollment is over 187,000 students. Again, we're a very large school division. Our births, five years ago, they've decreased as compared to the prior year. We had 15,649, and the prior year, and then 15,370, so a decrease of 279 less. The birth to kindergarten ratio, uh, meaning the birth of students, and then five years later, those that intend FCPS, our ratio increased by approximately 2% as compared to last year, and that's from 82% to 84%. This continues to add a degree of difficulty for us in terms of our demographers and their estimating when the number of kindergarten, estimating the number of kindergarten is due to that volatility in the birth to kindergarten ratio. We've had a positive net migration experienced in all grade levels except for the 12th grade. And these are students that are an in migration are those that are entering FCPS for the first time. The out migration are those that exit FCPS by contrast. Last year it was an increase of 430 and this year we've had an increase of 1,425. Our largest grade level cohorts were the 9th, 10th, and 11th grades. So let's go ahead and move on to the student enrollment projections. Our four-year projection, we've shown, actually in our five-year projection, we've shown a moderate growth rate. Our elementary enrollment is projected to decline. Even though we had a slight increase this year in birth to K, the ratio, and a net immigration in grades K through six, we're anticipating our enrollment at the elementary level to continue to decline and show that projection in the CIP document. The future growth is expected at the middle and high school levels. Um, as those cohorts matriculate through the grades that they have, our enrollment growth is expected to occur in the areas where surplus capacity may not be available. We're showing some increases in areas that we really didn't anticipate in previous CIPs. Um, you'll see them in, in your document both at Marshall McLean, Madison, and Oakton are just an example. And finally, the capacity pressure is expected in more middle and high schools. As many of you are aware, our funding sources really haven't changed all that much. We've been working real hard with, uh, collectively with our, your colleagues at the Board of Supervisors to increase our bond funding. Currently, we have a cap of $155 million a year for capital projects. We have operating expenses and the operating budget for minor capacity enhancements of 2.4 million and routine major maintenance of approximately $10 million. The Fairfax County Board of Supervisors with the Facility Infrastructure Management Committee, as you know, had identified uh, where savings are available at year end for uh, $13.1 million worth of major maintenance so that it would allow us a little increase in our ability to perform work in the uh, bond program but they have acknowledged that that doesn't seem enough given the rate of growth and so forth. And yet those conversations we had talked about, as you may recall, the 25 million potential, and due to the uh, fiscal forecast, I, I'm, I don't know where that really stands, but it, it's not looking really pretty, unfortunately. Capital project uh, summary, we have of the funded projects, you have the Route 1 project, uh, approximately 22 million that was in the FY13 bond referendum. Of unfunded projects, we have the Northwest County Elementary School. Uh, we do have the funding for the planning in that project, but the construction is uh, unfunded. That is a project in the McNair area. 
the Fairfax Oakton area elementary school is unfunded and that's near approximately Oakton Elementary in that region where you see the growth. And then the future uh, Western High School uh, continues to be unfunded in the Hutchison and out along the Silver Line area. Capital project summary of capacity enhancements that we have. We've funded projects at the South Lake High School. We have an addition uh, under construction currently. Uh, we have modular addition relocations planned from Marshall Woodson, uh, and we've had discussions about some other locations that have yet to be kind of unfolded. We have unfunded projects and modular addition relocation, a West Potomac addition that you'll see in the CIP. Uh, you also see a student, a Stewart High School addition and a Madison High School addition. The cash flow summary for the total five-year requirement is $824,007,124, of which we have a funded portion of $385,299,948 and an unfunded portion of $438,707,176. For the total 10-year requirement, we have $1,617,225,250. In the total 10-year requirement of which funded is $385,521,468 and an unfunded portion of $1,231,703,782. It's quite an extensive program. Capital project summary, under construction we have 14 renovations that are listed there and we have three new schools that are under construction. In planning we have 10 renovations that are ongoing. Uh, we have three middle school renovations. We have uh, Frost Middle School that's in planning and under construction we have high schools. We have four additions and three high school renovations. In planning in the November 17th bond referendum is Falls Church High School renovation and that's for the planning portion of uh, Falls Church High School. I know we've had a lot of discussions about that as well. The capital project summary, uh, renovations that are completing currently, we have Thoreau Middle School that is uh, completing and we also have Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. In addition, we have King Mill Elementary School, North Springfield Elementary School, and Springfield Estates Elementary School that are completing. In this CIP document, with the collaboration and the communication that we've had and the ongoing requests by the school board members, we've made enhancements to identify recommended solutions organized by pyramid, an enhanced visual format you'll find in the document, new resources in the appendices, data that has been asked for, we've discussed in previous work sessions to enhance this document, to make it more transparent and more readable. And of course, we incorporated recommendations from this governing body as well as the uh, Facilities Planning Advisory Council which by the way, I mean to give them credit as well for helping us and, and giving us assistance and comments in the development of this document. Uh, next steps, we had a planning meeting that we had on uh, Monday, December 5th of 2016. We have a work, had a work session. Tonight's presentation is for information only. It's really to give you an update as to what is in and uh, the CIP document and really what the trends are. I know you'll have a lot of questions. I, this is always an exciting time of the year for me, not only seasonally, uh, due to inclement weather, but also as part of the capital improvement program. And then uh, after Thursday, December 25th, we'll have the public hearing on Tuesday, January 10th, uh, work session Monday, January 23rd, and then an action, um, hopefully action by the school board on Thursday, January 26th. Um, with that, I'd like to also recognize Amy Hollop of the planning office. I know she's not with us this evening and her staff. They do an, uh, oh, she is here. Hey. Open the door and influenza. Good to see you, Amy. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you, but her, Amy and her planning staff, Dr. Holland and her planning staff, really do an outstanding job of making all the modifications in really a short time frame uh, from when we actually get the enrollment data that's been certified and cleansed and cleaned. Uh, Mary Beth Loveclass and her team does an excellent job doing that, but once we get that data in order to present it, prepare it, and then make our forecast and the staff recommendations that we have before you this evening, it really is an uh, all-hands-on-deck effort, and I just want to commend both Kevin Sneed and Amy Holub for the, and their staff for the work that they do, and Lori St. Cyr, definitely. So with that, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have this evening. I know you've got a full agenda. As I said, this is an information item, and I know there will be many questions that we'll be following if, if you don't have any this evening right now. Thank you, Mr. Plattenberg. And as uh, you just uh, put up on the, um, on the screen there for the public, uh, we do 
provide a little bit more time on this document because it's such a, a massive and important document. Um, the speakers list for the hearing, I believe, is already open, Madam Clerk, is that correct? It's uh, The speakers list, I believe, is open from now until January 9th for the January 10th hearing. So anyone who would like to speak at the uh, January 10th public hearing, um, please do go online um, or call the school board office and you may sign up then. And I, uh, we do have um, a couple of people who would like to ask questions. Uh, we will have a um, uh, work session on this on January 23rd as well. Mr. Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Prattenberg, you sound a little down today. You use, uh, usually <laughs> been up there. I'm trying to build up for Dr. Duran when he gets, he's got oh, a great, see, great I presentation. See, I, see. I was just wondering whether because you, are, you, you sound, you know, you are down because of that magnitude of unfunded oh, yeah. needs. It's so great that there was no reason for you to be up it. But I don't want to uh, uh, make situation any worse, but I still need to make a couple, you know, a couple of comments and ask you a couple of questions if you don't mind. That $13.1 million additional capital funding that we did receive from Board of Supervisors last year, that was out of their yield and surplus, correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Uh, I mean, is that is that your uh, expectation for that to continue on a yearly basis? Or since county, just like us, is not really, uh, you know, you, you know, both of us, you know, both bodies are faced with a dire financial situation that that may not continue. You make a good point, Mr. Moon. The commitment was as long as funding was available that they would be able to provide that. They've made a strong commitment and a showing that they're gonna provide that for us. But again, it was as funds are available at year end. That was the, and I defer to finance. Uh, Susan and, I'm gonna make a clarifying um, statement here. The 13.1 million initially was from their year end surplus. But since then, it has been built into their baseline transfer to the Great. school system. But that, that's not recurring. part of the transfer though. They have, it's a sort of like a separate pot where they will set aside $13.1 million but in addition to regular transfer. Correct, but it is in their baseline. The baseline budget. Correct. Okay, that's good. So uh, that $155 million of that capital transfer to us, how long has the, how long has the amount stayed, remained at, at the level? Off the top of my head, I don't recall. I know it's been- Is it like a 10, 12 years? Yeah, it's been least? over 10 years, Mr. Moon. Um, oh. By the way, I made the mistake of not recognizing Susan Quinn. I mean, she, our chief operating officer, she keeps, she keeps I don't, us all- I don't think great. she needs any more recognition. People know Yeah, I don't know who she is, as right. As a chief operating um, But it's officer. been over 10 years, Mr. Moon. You are accurate in that. It's been a long time. Okay, uh, I, I think we need to, uh, yes, in a school board, and yes, in a board of supervisors, we really need to sit down and talk about that again because I don't think we can, you know, have you know that amount just remain at that level for 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 the future. Yes, sir. Uh, having said that, I s need to go back to a my favorite, very unpleasant topic mm -hmm. of the number of trailers we are using for instruction in Fairfax County. Is that still about eleven hundred, or is it? Yes, sir, on, on page 104, we've included that because we know that that's one of your areas. So about 1,100, that has not come down no, within the last several years, has it? Well, the number of trailers has actually come down, but the actual cost to go ahead and remove them. We would make a conscientious point to remove trailers as we finish up our renovations and additions. So we have been eliminating for operational reasons. It, it's a cost savings measure to eliminate trailers where we complete our renovations and additions. But we have a report that begins on page 104 that talks explicitly to your concerns as I well. do think you're gonna set aside some time on, on January yeah. 23rd to talk about whether whether we're gonna present any concrete plan uh, to the board and, and board of supervisors and the community and you know, how to eliminate it, you know, all those trailers because, I mean, how many, how many students do we do we educate in those 1,100 trailers? Yeah, it's massive. I bet that it's yes, more sir. than 20,000 yes, students. Sir. And you, you know, earlier you mentioned about size of Arlington school system being, what, 25, 26,000, and city of Alexandria only about 15,000. So we educate 
the number of students which exceeds the entire city of Alexandria in trailers. And I don't find that acceptable. And in my 18 years of service on the board, the number has only grown. I understand, I mean, it wasn't, you know, your shops, you know, none of us wanted that to happen. But I think that has to be really forcefully presented to the funding authority and to the community. And in order for us to do that, we need to have a concrete plan. This has to happen. And this way, this is the best way to tackle. I mean, I want us, I want us to have that opportunity to have that discussion. I mean, All I've been asking for that for, you know that, for a number of years. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Mrs. Hoff. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Plattenberg. I think some of my favorite meetings are when we sit down with maps that are bigger than the table. So um, I'm going to ask a question that I would just maybe uh, expect to see at a work session mm -hmm. not to be answered tonight. But you mentioned a new school off of elementary school off of Route 1, which mm -hmm. I'd seen before. I know that's not brand new. Um, I'm going to feel bad asking while Ms. Corbett Sanders isn't here. Mm -hmm. But just for public and, and my understanding, can you explain a little bit in the work session, why there's so many s elementary schools around that area that are under capacity. I know there's a couple that are over capacity, but how we go about that decision that we're not looking at boundaries, but we're adding a school. I think it's a good conversation for us to have publicly and um, to discuss sort of our decision points on, on new construction, renovation, and, and boundary changes. Absolutely, there's been a lot of shift in region three and um, we could definitely talk about that in the work session. I know Ms. Dernick Kovacs has been uh, in some of the discussions with us about that as well. Okay, and um, this is actually kind of a follow on to Mr. Moon. Are there any trailers at schools that are under capacity? That are under capacity? Um, not that I'm aware of. If, if there are trailers that are at school, I can follow up with you during the work session to that. I can grab Okay, I'd, I'd like to, to know the yeah. answer to that as well. If there are, generally they're for other programs that uh, for reasons we hadn't moved them or we're in the process of relocating them to someplace else, but I'll, I'll give you okay. that as a follow-up. And, and not including those under renovation. Right. Yeah, okay, right, right. all right, thank you. Mrs. Strauss. First, thank you very much for the, for the entire document and uh, I very much appreciate um, the additional information and um, the various new charts. Uh, I think it's very, very helpful. I also wanna thank you at, for one of the previous work sessions um, where we had a presentation on um, planned growth throughout the county where the Board of Supervisors is, is, uh, has actively changed the comprehensive plan and they're looking at, at um, more residential and commercial development. Uh, and again, I would be remiss if I didn't um, uh, represent that I have some constituents who border Tyson's and are concerned about over time how that growth is going to be accommodated. And um, uh, Mr. Sneed um, came to a meeting in October with Spring Hill parents. Um, and I think their, their concern is that so much of Tyson's right now is within the Spring Hill attendance area. And we've explained that there will be a new school there uh, when the time is appropriate. But I think that there is concern that as this growth comes, how will it be accommodated? And mm -hmm. I know their concern is they don't want to have the entire growth be within their elementary school, the four or 500 children that would eventually be served by that uh, elementary school. So I think now that the CIP is out, we need to have a conversation again with the schools surrounding Tyson's to help them understand the timeline and um, uh, how that gradual growth will be accommodated and that no, there is not the expectation that one elementary school would absorb the entire growth uh, until a new elementary school is built sometime into the future. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Plattenberg, uh, the questions I have, I think, are just in the nature of sort of clarifying um, and mostly for um, the public because, and, and I probably, when I dig in, maybe we can find these answers, but maybe you can just provide mm -hmm. uh, just some quick understanding for everyone. So um, one of the bullets on uh, student enrollment projections talks about enrollment growth um, expected in areas where we may not have capacity. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about 
the um, demographic analysis that you that you use? How do we get that information uh, so that we can we can actually have that sort of vision as to where the growth we expect the growth to be? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mr. Wilson. What we do is um, we've we've been implementing this new demographic program where we actually geocode student location. And we take a look at where students um, actually attend, reside, their residing schools. We look at um, individual programs that they may participate in, advantages that they take advantage of, um, and where that actual location is where they may actually attend school. So we're able to see some shifts that happen, um, not only within that kind of a structure, but also transfers that go on within the school division. So uh, we basically can break down in a bunch of different data elements. We have a, a dashboard that there's a link onto our website that has all of this data rolled into it. And it's very user friendly. We've actually had groups, organizations that have already begun to look in it and begin to raise questions about uh, things that they're seeing and trends that they're seeing in, within that dashboard. So on, on the website then, uh, a citizen could go and see a, a particular area and, and kind of drill down to find out yes, why sir. the projections are that way for that school. Yes, sir. And that's, it does show uh, all of the reasons uh, for a lot of those transfers. That's part of our growth and uh, development in this initiative. And, and also, this is, um, in, you also mentioned that the, the three largest grade cohorts were 9, 10, 11. Mm -hmm. Do you know offhand what the three smallest cohorts are? Well, we're still looking at that, and we can take that up as a follow-up for the work session. Um, certainly, when we pr presented on December 5th, we showed uh, some trends there, and, and, and some of your colleagues asked questions about and I think you may have as well, uh, specifically in the 12th grade. And we're still looking into providing answers and responses as to what that may have been an indicator of to give you more exacting response. Okay. And then um, I think this is, was sli your slide six. Um, on the website, can uh, is there a way to unpack these numbers for the cash flow summaries? to sort of get into the... Yes, sir, and, and those are found within your CIP document. I know we just got it to you pretty much at the last minute, and when you look at the over 131 pages, including glossary of terms, it's not something you can look at overnight. Um, but it does identify the cash flow. It does articulate what the queue is, the renovation queue, which shows when things do happen and do occur. We do identify schools that are listed in the short or near term. And that's also in the longer term or the out years. Um, there are pages that do cover that that are included in the CIP document that was posted online. Yeah. On the website, though, is it, is, there, is it easy for somebody to find if they wanted to, kind of, or, or do they have to go into meetings and then go into it, the agenda? And then no, I think they could, uh, to be, uh, yeah, to, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Uh, in this document, it does provide that, and I believe that they can actually look at what was posted online for this evening's presentation. The CIP document that's posted uh, does have a table of content and contents that does identify where that information is. In fact, when I was looking for, you know, page 41 last year was the summary page that was really the to-do list of the planning team. And Dr. Holub and her wisdom decided to make it so I could be able to find it again this year, and she put it on page 41 again for this year. So that just by chance, given all the changes that go on in a CIP document. Um, and that shows really um, just all of the, uh, the boundary or what, what staff's recommendation is at the relook. If you look at page 29, page 30, page 31, page 32, and so forth of the CIP document, it does talk to, and that is where the cash flow is identified, and it has the list of individual projects on that page, and it shows in the matrix in the grid of when that's gonna begin. I've already had questions about that, um, and, and uh, when some of these projects actually do occur, the rankings are on the pages prior to that. So there are places where the public can find the information that you're talking about. All right, and the last question I have is, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding the slides, but on, on slide, for capital project summary new construction, you, you list Fairfax Oakton Area Elementary School unfunded. And then on the summary table, a couple slides later, it's listed as one of the ones that's under construction. On the summary page on, on slide seven? On slide seven, yes. Yeah, I, d I don't see the uh, one you're speaking of. 
So at the bottom of the first column on page seven, it says Fairfax Oakton Elementary School. That's the under construction column. Oh, that's that's true. And then on the unfunded, it's, it's what's listed as one of the unfunded projects. So, so we could probably answer that up here. Um, Kevin is coming to the microphone. It's because within the five years, we anticipate that it'll go on the bond referendum in 2017, so it'll be under construction within the five years. But Kevin could provide a little bit more information. Mm -hmm. uh, that's correct. So that's the, the, the listing of the projects is based upon the five-year window. So for, uh, our anticipation is that the Fairfax Oakton Elementary School uh, would be listed in the 2017 bond uh, for planning and the 2019 bond for construction. Therefore, it would occur within that window. Yeah, but it is a good point. We do need to footnote the difference between what we have in our window versus what is funded and unfunded because on that other prior slide, we do identify what does have funding and what does not have funding. So I think a footnote to annotate that would make so it So on, sli on slide four, are all of the unfunded projects considered gonna be captured in the expected future bond? Yes, but it may, it may be the 17 and then beyond depending on where these things fall out. For example, the future Western High School. Uh, we don't have the growth that's needing or demanding that high school. We're showing increasing in membership that we may have to for that purpose but uh, it will be further out than say, for example, the elementary school that you just mentioned, the Oakton Elementary School. Okay. And again, these kind of questions, we can go yeah, in much more sure. detail at the work session. Thank but you. Uh, thank you for pointing that out because you know, that's kind of how we've gotten a lot of the improvements that we have. When you make something like that, that, that doesn't seem intuitive, although we may from a staff perspective because we work with it, by annotating or footnoting that, we can make it clearer and more transparent for the public. So I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Schultz. So I want to um, thank uh, Mr. Moon for bringing up one of my perennial topics, um, trailers, mm -hmm. um, trailers and sack, um, trailers and um, the movement and cost of trailers to the overall system and where that relates to um, spacing. and. Um, I know Dr. Lip is not with us tonight, but um, in particular, I struggle in the Springfield district for special um, program placement mm -hmm. um, for children with special needs, um, for special programs, and children travel further distances because there simply isn't the room and the facilities. And I, I'm wondering if there is a way um, in a future work session to tie together the um, the work session that we had where we had the uh, long-term development and areas of growth, mm -hmm. um, those slides with the CIP. I don't know, it's sort, we sort oh, of right. get yeah. in information in that, mm -hmm. got information in that, that was very salient, frankly, to the CIP. And mm -hmm. it, it's as if there are portions of that that we need to merge along with the work that you and Mr. Sneed are doing with the, um, the geocoding of the students. Mm -hmm. I'm very pleased to see that, but also on the out years, how that um, the other presentation is going to affect um, the the work that's existing here and mm -hmm. things like well, you know, we don't have the you know the downstream population. Um, it's interesting you know I you said the ninth, tenth, and eleventh are our greatest cohort ages. I don't. I don't know what was happening from 1999 to 2002, <laughs> um, but it's going to be a cold winter, so we better start planning, like, you know, right. whatever, you know, 16 years out, um, really five years out. Um, uh, my question comes, and it's also on a perennial, is what do we do to finally proactively talk about um, integrating uh, SAC classroom space with existing um, brick and mortar classrooms mm -hmm. so that we can recapture the majority of those because uh, you know anything that's reserved that's not used for classroom use during the day mm -hmm. as a regular classroom and I don't mean rotating out and taking a test or having a meeting or something um, in a SAC room but I mean fully integrating uh, the 
resources that the county has sort of co-located, if you will, in our facilities that is not used during the day in those elementary buildings um, as an academic space when really we're at a, at a dearth for seats mm -hmm. um, in, so, in so many places. I think it's becoming paramount. And Mr. Moon, you're exactly right. It's, I, the time has come. You know, I, I mean, I know that I'm sort of a broken record on some of these things, but it's, as, it's because I'm pushing a rock, you know, and I'm gonna keep pushing the rock on some of these things because we need those seats back. And having a comprehensive conversation with the Board of Supervisors, you know, it's all the same money. You know, they, we may have it divided and it may not be enough, but at the end, you know, working together to really start to form and, and you know, Dr. Lockard, you know, this falls a little bit on your shoulders because you're, you're, you're the man with the plan for right now, um, for, for this year. Uh, it, we, we have to have this comprehensive conversation. Um, and, you know, if we need to do something um, to put it on, you know, a special joint session with the Board of Supervisors, um, if we need to have a, an emboldened conversation with them, but we would need to have the information going forward, I think, um, to say, look, you know, and I, I, I'm going from, and it's probably a couple of years ago, but you know, it's like 6,000 seats that if you layer mm -hmm. together all of the classrooms that, mm -hmm. you know, and I know it's not, they're not all 25 to 28, but it, there, there's a lot of seats there to be recaptured. So maximizing the way the resources that we have available to us is, is critical, would you not agree? Yeah, and uh, the ones you mentioned, uh, Ms. Schultz, you know, predominantly at the elementary level, of course, for the SAC program. And again, looking at uh, the location of where they are, of where we need seats and capacity. Uh, I know we had a lengthy discussion about it at one time because it is a passion of yours that you, you do articulate quite well. Um, I was looking to see if there was a document that was included in here, but yeah, it does relate to capacity. I know FPACs brought that up before as well. Uh, it's an important partnership, of course, our school age child care uh, component, um, but it is, but it is part of a broader capacity issue when we talk about seats and. So there's so a, there's both the, the overall capacity of where we need seats, and that that's sort of like the general education seats mm -hmm. where we just kind of need physical seats, but it's almost as if we need in the CIP, and you know this is work with Dr. Lip and mm -hmm. you know potentially others, um, also. Um, like a heat map of where you need program type seats. Oh, like, yeah, you know, where there it. is, you. you know, and I think because um, mm -hmm. we've talked about monopoles a lot lately um, on a completely different note, but when I went to a monopole map, you know, there were whole areas of the county that were black, you know, with, with an absence of monopole coverage. And then there were other areas where they practically overlapped each other. It's a little bit the same concept mm -hmm. that there are places where we're missing physical seats for particular things, and there's a need for seats there. And it's sort of, you know, it's layering over the old, um, I, I forget what the, the flip films were and the overhead projector, right. you know, uh, but, but yeah. I'm seeing, you know, layering one and then on top of another, on top of another, mm -hmm. which is, you know, where, where do we need seats generally? Where do we need seats for, you know, special Programs. education mm -hmm. needs, autism needs, right. you know, um, um, et cetera. And then um, lastly, you know, uh, this is also my, my time to bring up, uh, as a part of that presentation where we had growth, there was a lot of growth that was presented along the um, Fairfax County Braddock corridor mm -hmm. that was frankly surprising to me. Um, it was in Ms. Strauss, you, you had brought up uh, the Tyson's area, and that was one of the concentrations, route one was the other, but I was surprised to see that. And right. it wasn't something that I was necessarily anticipating because I haven't seen it on things like proper. So I think it's just beyond that. But you know, I've got in um, a, a seven mile radius um, overcrowded schools, and I have one school that remains, you know, wasted taxpayer resources, unutilized, and children in being educated in trailers um, because we're not, uh, frankly, being good stewards of the of the public's money and the public's resources. 
and um, I think it's time that we have that conversation as well. So I look forward to those. I'm not necessarily expecting you to answer those, but those are some top level things where, you know, really it talks about stewardship and fiduciary responsibility with the public's money and the public's resources. So thank you. If I'm. Thank you. Um, so just briefly, and this is something we can come back to in work sessions and conversations, um, but just from the Hunter Mill perspective, um, I'm glad to see that um, Hunter Mill, you know, Reston, Vienna, that little part of Herndon that we have continues to get good attention in spite of our constraints. Um, I think, you know, there's so much development and change and growth in that part of the county. Um, and yet we've, we've seen additions and renovations and even changes in programs and boundaries, you know, that have really been helpful. So I feel like Hunter Mill is getting good attention um, and support, and I appreciate that. There's just a couple of town of Vienna issues that I thought I would bring up and we can maybe continue to talk about. Um, uh, one is, uh, you know, the Louise Archer, and I see that that's on here, which is great. We want to try to get that. Um, uh, modular, which I taught in, and it's a perfectly nice building, but the town's not too happy with it there, and we want to do the addition, so we have a brick and mortar classrooms instead. And I actually had a nice conversation with the mayor of Vienna the other day, where um, you know they recognize that that is a really important historic building in the history of Fairfax County. It's one of the few schools we have that goes back more than a half a century, and it was uh, originally the Vienna Colored School, you know, back then uh, before schools were desegregated, and does have a great history and. Um, you know, they're interested, the town is, in um, helping us to recognize that history as we go through the renovation. So, and then the, the other question from the town is Madison High School, and I see that we're talking about adding on to Madison in here. I think the concern there is that, is that an effort to catch some of the Tyson's Corner growth? And so I think they're a little bit worried about that stretch between Tyson's Corner and Madison at the other end of Vienna. So that might be something that we wanna okay. address and mm -hmm. think about, but thank you. Um, let's see, we're not seeing anyone else with questions. I'll just ask a few of my own and um, make a couple of comments. Uh, Mr. Plattenberg, thank you for mentioning Falls Church High School. Uh, we, we finally are at a point where it's going to get on the bond. So I would like you to, uh, for, on behalf of the, uh, for the public, to uh, just uh, reiterate and reassure them that, that Falls Church is on the uh, 2017 bond. Is that correct? Yes, it is, absolutely, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. It is on the 17th. I know we've been looking at that, and there was a, there was a sense of conversation in work sessions in years past, and certainly near and dear to your heart as well, um, as well as other members of the body. But um, the, the 155 cap, and the type of projects that we have, and the out years, um, and we talk about growth and when things are going to come in and when we can execute utilization of this facility or that. It really is a balancing act. Um, that's why it's so crucial that we, we, we advance and increase our ability to have a larger cap, as Mr. Moon mentioned, over 10 years, um, because projects like Falls Church then end up getting, you know, it's just a simple mathematical equation, 155 million a year when we've got high schools and middle schools that are pretty significant projects. Um, that's challenging. But yes, it is in there for design in the 17 bond referendum. Um, is, uh, and I may have missed it, is there a list of the uh, projects that are on the 17 bond in this document? No, but I think that's a good idea. I think um, along with uh, some of the comments Mr. Wilson uh, suggested about the footnoting and some of the other ones, uh, members of your colleagues, I think we'll take that as a, another enhancement that we can go ahead and take a look at providing of what we may anticipate in future bond referendums. Okay, I think that It ties into excellent. the cash flow, so that's a logical right. you know, evolution of that. Right. And I will have so, some more detailed questions about the, the cash flow as we go along. Um, you and I have talked about that in the past, just to, to understand for the, again, for the community when they can actually expect to, uh, to see action on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as a couple of other things, well, you mentioned bonding, and so I, I will also follow up on what uh, Mr. Moon said. I do think I, we, we had some um, heartening news last year when uh, Mr. Long seemed to be saying that he wanted the uh, bond cap to be increased. He thought it was time. Um, I, I certainly would support um, our board urging the Board of Supervisors to raise that cap. I know that they have other issues they have to deal with, um, and that's probably something that we should think about as a board as to uh, how we can go about encouraging them to do that. I do think that that's important mm -hmm. for um, uh, both our renovations, our additions, you know, new construction, 
um, we don't want to get farther and farther behind. So um, I would welcome a conversation with my colleagues about uh, what we can do to, um, to encourage the Board of Supervisors to, to raise that cap. Um, I did have a question. With I, I, um, I haven't gone through in, in um, as much detail as I will before we have our work session, but I see um, Glasgow at one point in the future is listed as being significantly under capacity. Now I assume that that is only because we have putting a modular in there. Is that correct? Yes, it, it is. In fact, that's one of the recommendations of the modulars that we have. Um, but we can go into more detail and talk at, at length about what the plans are inside the CIP document when you get a chance to read it. Mm -hmm. um, underneath those schools, you will see the articulation of when those things will happen. And that's where I was going to ask you, because I yeah, know I'm we sorry. had asked you to bring right. us the, the breakdown of core capacity, modular, and trailers, because, you know, modular is always in the, in the capacity. And in some ways, I think that can be misleading, misleading mm -hmm. if um, mm -hmm. the core capacity of the cafeteria, the gymnasium, is for one number, and, uh, and we've added classrooms. So um, I'll find that when I, uh, in this document. You should, document. yeah. If you, okay. And if uh, you're having any issues with it, just give us a call. Okay. We'll, All we'll right. I, I do think that it's important for the public to understand, again, in the Glasgow situation, that is beyond capacity now. We have more students in, uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but but they are over capacity, even though that they were um, built to be a very large middle school. And um, now we're looking at needing to add capacity there. So when someone looks at, at that in the future and says, oh, well, it's, it's under capacity, it's not really. Um, we, we, are beyond, we are beyond the capacity, but we are going to add there so we can accommodate the students. And, it, and I guess another piece of that is if, um, if this were being dealt with with trailers, then it wouldn't show up that way. Is that correct? For example, if we if we added trailers at Glasgow to take care of their problem, um, they would sh still be showing com uh, over capacity. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And you you'll have uh, on page 52 is the region two that speaks to Glasgow. Okay. And then when you look at uh, 54, page 54, okay, it articulates in the um, the school years. Okay. In each of those years, the capacity at each of the schools within the pyramid. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that's very helpful. And I, you know, going back to the trailer issue, I do see that Region Two um, has uh, the most trailers in it. About a third of the trailers in, um, I'm, I'm counting around 300 of the nearly. Well, yeah. okay, it's it's listing 900 trailers here, but um, so and and I'm seeing that there are some schools that are listed as being under capacity. And yet we still have a lot of trailers. So I would like to have more of a conversation well, about why that that's, that was you know, why 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 that's mm -hmm. the case. Um, and with that, um, thank you so much uh, for you. all your work. Uh, you know, I think this document gets um, better and better every year. We get a, a, a wealth of data from it. So thank you for for everyone who participated. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We move on to item 3.03, Strategic Plan Goal 1, Strategies 1 and 2, Student Success, and I call on Dr. Lockhart for an introduction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it gives me great pleasure to, here in just a minute, introduce our incredible team to present Strategic Plan Ignite Goal 1, Student Success. Uh, this presentation really represents the core mission of our school system, and tonight uh, we will present the first two overarching strategies uh, which read in part to ensure all students receive an education in a dynamic environment and to ensure all students achieve their full potential through the use of assessment data systems. The other two overarching uh, goals of goal one will be presented at a later uh, date. And we will also uh, have opportunity in upcoming uh, school board work sessions to dive into uh, these first two, uh, two overarching strategies as well. We have much good news to uh, report. Um, we also know we have areas where we need more work and we continue to focus on the achievement gap. But you'll see uh, throughout the report and the presentation that FCPS remains con committed to continuous improvement. Um, before we introduce the team, we have a short video segment uh, that we believe will really highlight. Um, we're, we're very proud of this uh, capturing of some of the successes we feel like we've been able to uh, um, portray here in terms of much of the work that started with our strategic plan. So I think you will enjoy that. I think it's an appropriate way to kick off 
uh, some of the some of the work that we'd like to share with you this evening. So with that, we'll go to uh, the video. Today's classroom is based on an assembly line model with children sitting neatly in columns and rows. They receive each predetermined subject and are drilled to demonstrate knowledge. Rote memorization. is to become a career firefighter and you know hopefully be someone in the business um, but even if they're not going into that um, communication respect confidence working together as part of a team you know all of those are, are huge things that they're going to get out of this course the students are um, solving authentic problems, global challenges, um, and integrating three years of science, three years of mathematics, and technology and engineering. We've got kids with all kinds of ability levels and different experiences here. They're thinking, and they're doing, and that's, it's incredible to see that. Um, with cybersecurity classes and networking classes, what I like about them is that the information that I learn is often coupled with these real-life situations and a lot of hands-on application that we do in class. This helps us because you have to know how to work with people that you're not used to working, and that helps with your communication skills. So today we're doing a project um, about all these kinds of different um, issues kind of around the world. My group in particular is doing political corruption around the world. Um, it's just a lot of working together and like, you know, kind of whoever you get with, you kind of have to make it work. I think one application of student portfolio is that it increases student engagement with the material and you can see their growth set in any uh, content area that they select to do uh, a project in. Uh, I think it helps us stay connected as a class because we do have like Google Classroom and they can it helps us with like warm-ups and stuff so it helps students stay engaged. You have a lot of people who have different ideas, different backgrounds, different mindsets, working together to make one product. So aside from the technical knowledge you gain, you also gain the ability to learn how to work in a group and accomplish one goal. Geometry to physics. Learn and listen. Learn very practical skills. I do expect them to try and to fail and to try again. The best teachers connect learning to the outside world. Okay, so who's not fired up for goal one <laughs> report, huh? <laughs> We'd like to thank our team for putting that together and for our teachers and students and staff who are making those things happen. Um, that's fantastic. I now uh, introduce Dr. Francisco Duran, our Chief Academic Officer. He has a team of outstanding people with him and I'll let him introduce them when the time is right. Uh, and for now, we will turn it over to Dr. Duran. Thank you and good evening board members. It's a pleasure to be back and if you remember a year ago when I was here, it was about 11 o'clock at night presenting this, so I thank you for letting me come up a little earlier this evening. Um, but with me tonight is a great uh, team who are really responsible for making sure that all of this work happens and supporting the work. So I'd just like to briefly introduce those that are here. Dr. Presidio from our Instructional Services, Dr. Oliver from the Office of Student Testing, Noel Clemenko from our Curriculum Office, and Rich Polio from ESOL Department as well. So. We're really pleased to have them here with me as we um, are able to share with you some updates and give you some uh, exciting news while also highlight some of the areas that we're still continuing to work on. And as Dr. Lockhart said, we will be um, only presenting part one and two of goal one tonight and the second, the third, three and four we will present later on and we will certainly be able to engage with you in our work session on January 23rd. So I'd like to begin with overarching strategy one. Um, one second, let me. 
Okay. Overarching strategy one, which speaks to enhancing our instructional practices to ensure that all of our students reach their full potential. To this end, as you can see, there are five desired outcomes that I'm going to highlight for you this evening. And we're just going to talk about a little bit of the work that's happening. We also want you to know that there is so much more information that we provided in the narrative that has been uploaded to Board Docs. So we encourage um, the, the public as well as board members to take a look at the narrative uh, in lieu of being resp respectful of time. Not gonna get into all of the work, but we do well to encourage that you look at the uh, narrative. As you can see also in overarching strategy one, there is a variety of metrics, monitoring metrics, and um, tonight in interest of time, we're going to focus on a couple of the key metrics, and again, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have at the board se work session on January 23rd, and also all of the information that you will see for every metric is included in the narrative. The first outcome tonight that we'd like to talk about is related to work happening in the portrait of a graduate. And since 2014, we have been committed to the portrait of a graduate as the defining piece of our work. It is a great articulation of all of the work that we'd like to see and the learning we'd like to see. You saw some of it in the video just a few moments ago. And it really is what provides our direction in the area of curriculum, instruction, and assessment. When we introduced Portrait of a Graduate to our schools, there was definitely a lot of excitement about this new direction that the framework was taking us in, teaching and learning. However, there was a lot of questions about what this looked like and how we, teachers and schools can make this happen in their buildings. So of course, we knew that we would need to provide them with some more than just the outcomes and what the Portrait of a Graduate was. We wanted to be able to provide them with some guidance and a framework for what that would look like. So this year, instructional services team, working with our division leadership, developed what you see on this slide, which is the FCPS learning model, comprised of four domains and three belief statements. The three belief statements that you see on this slide represent our ongoing collective commitment to collaboration and equity, while the four domains that you see on this slide represent the teaching and learning practices that will help us to ultimately reach those portrait of a graduate outcomes. The first domain that you see on the top left is learner-centered environment. This domain supports students in taking an active role in their learning. Instruction in this type of environment recognizes the differences in student learning needs and also incorporates student interest ability and learning preferences. Second, you'll see on the top right, is the concept-based curriculum domain. This represents the rigorous curriculum that is aligned to larger essential learnings and understandings. Such a curriculum helps us to provide students and teachers to move beyond mere facts and provides deeper learning outcomes as students make connections across disciplines and to the world around them. The third domain you see on the bottom right is meaningful learning experiences. This helps provide students with the learning opportunities to construct their own knowledge and also in our learning model, this emphasizes the practice that allows students to make meaningful information through inquiry, discovery, focusing on higher level thinking and rather than just rote learning and memorization. You saw that also in the video in a couple of the examples where students are really making those connections. The last domain on this model is purposeful assessments. This area we are really working to promote a use of a wide variety of assessment methods to make sure that we're measuring student learning of both content and also those skills that are needed to support students' ability to monitor their own growth. This model again was launched this past summer and has received a positive response from our schools. ISD is currently designing curriculum and resources to support this model and, is and we're also working to provide professional development and staff to make sure that they are able to use these innovative practices. Next, our planning and pacing guides, they are the core vehicle for supporting teachers with the delivery of a concept-based curriculum. The documents that you'll see here and that you can reference on our web, web page provide comprehensive support for teachers through building their content 
and their pedagogical knowledge, as well as highlighting instruction and assessment resources that will allow for increased differentiation. Each unit of study that has been prepared is aligned to enduring understandings and essential questions that promote a deeper understanding of the content. The quote on this slide, as you see from an elementary teacher in FCPS, captured after a recent professional development on the new social studies planning and pacing guide, captures both the quality of the document and the appreciation for the resource. The teacher said, quote, curriculum has been adjusted for a whole child approach to learning. Knowledge is wonderful, but application and process-based understanding is even better. The commonality in layout across the disciplines has allowed teachers to implement the resources more efficiently and effectively. We've recently heard from a principal that her teachers are reporting that the new math pace, planning and pacing guide is very easy to use and has helped them to save time with useful links and makes it very appropriate to help them provide enrichment to students. We are currently in full implementation with mathematics and social studies, piloting the language arts and are beginning the development of science planning and pacing guides. The content of all of these documents will continue to evolve as more curriculum integration and blended learning resources are added. Recently, one of our language arts pilot teachers wrote, and I will quote from her, what she wrote, I'm excited to see the impact that planning and pacing guides are going to have on developing teacher knowledge and practice and bring cohesiveness to instruction across the county in the next couple of years. So as you can see, the planning and pacing guides have been a great tool for us to give teachers as a resource that will ultimately help connect that learning that we're looking for in terms of content, matched with those skills of portrait of a graduate. Literacy is our number one division-wide strategy for reaching our portrait of a graduate. Without the ability to read, write, discuss, and think, students will struggle to reach their potential as communicators, collaborators, and critical and creative thinkers. We believe that developing the literacy skills of all students is critical and therefore we have prioritized the investment of time and money in both the resources and professional development across the division in this area. Several actions have been taken to ensure that as a division, we have a consistent approach to literacy instruction and that teachers have the necessary resources to evaluate and make instructional decisions for all students. First, we have updated our literacy curriculum to ensure that all students are instructed on foundational literacy skills like phonics. On this slide, you will see one of the literacy progression charts that has been created. These charts span kindergarten through sixth grade and help extend teachers' understandings of word learning and development, developmental spelling for grades K through six so they can effectively introduce, support, and reinforce literacy behaviors, including the identification of potential dyslexia markers. In relation to dyslexia, a lot of work has been done. Our online FCPS Dyslexia Handbook will be soon available in January. This resource will articulate a consistent FCPS approach for identification, intervention, and accommodations for students with dyslexia and provide both internal and external audiences clarity moving forward. In addition, I know the board is aware of our pilot of a universal screener that is currently underway. This tool assesses foundational skills in reading and plays an important role of identifying learning needs to be addressed for intervention of all students, but certainly those um, with dyslexia. More information about this tool will be shared later in this presentation. At both the elementary and secondary level, school literacy teams have now been created to cultivate school-wide commitments to literacy progress across all grade levels and all disciplines. These teams, supported by resources and professional development from the instructional services, lead the literacy work in their buildings ensuring that the approach to authentic learning 
and their school context in the area of literacy is happening on a daily basis. To support the work of these teams, frameworks at each level have been created. The elementary literacy framework, which I think the board was aware of last year I introduced, provides guidance on the components of effective reading and writing, as well as guidance on how to implement best practices in the classroom. Teachers can now access this framework to deepen their understanding about literacy instruction and gain ideas on setting up effective literacy learning environments, how to maximize their instructional time, or also how to implement appropriate assessment strategies. Recently added to this framework, there are literacy look force, which can be used by teachers for self reflection and goal setting and also by instructional leaders to support teachers in providing feedback on literacy. Exciting literacy work is also happening at the middle and high school levels. We believe strongly that the literacy work at the secondary level must extend beyond English classrooms. Rather, we must consistently make sure that we provide students the opportunities to read, write, think, and discuss in all subject areas. The cross-curriculum approach requires new learning for many of our middle and high school readers. The secondary literacy framework is working to support this significant change. This framework is serving as a blueprint for the significant actions that schools and teams and teachers are taking to support that growth of literacy of all of their students. This resource provides specific examples of what these actions actually look like within each of the academic disciplines. And it is also a comprehensive bank of resources to support literacy in each content area. Finally, our commitment to literacy can, is evident through the intentional dedication of professional development that we have given to this topic. The focus of all of our county, all county principal meetings is non literacy for the second year in a row. And we are reinforcing that literacy is our number one strategy for meeting portrait of a graduate outcomes for all students. In addition, as you can see, many other professional development events have taken place. This past summer was the second year that FCPS offered the Elementary Literacy Symposium, where we provided an opportunity for elementary school teams to collaborate and learn about literacy instruction. In fact, over 1,300 participants from 141 schools attended these sessions to deepen their understanding of effective writing instruction, and they worked together during this time to plan for the upcoming school year. This event continued to receive high praise, it was the second year that it happened, with 95% of the participants stating that they intended to apply the skills and knowledge that they learned this past summer into this current school year. In addition to the elementary symposium, we have revised the Great Beginnings program for our new teachers to focus on literacy instruction to make sure that we're aligning their understandings with the expectations of the division. This past summer was very exciting in that we also marked the first secondary literacy symposium. This event provided an opportunity for each of our middle and high school teams to establish a liter literacy focus in preparation for being able to lead that work in their buildings. So we brought together teams from all middle and, and high school schools to help them build common understandings and expectations around reading, writing, and student engagement and gave them an opportunity to begin to plan for the school year. One high school principal shared these comments with us. As a team, we deepened our commitments to the urgency of supporting literacy across the disciplines and left with a plan for the new year on how to implement best practices surrounding literacy in all curricular areas. Three follow-up sessions are taking place this school year, which is giving teams at all of our secondary schools the opportunity to continue their learning while also being given a forum to share their progress, ask questions, and problem solve the challenges that they're facing. So as you can see, the literacy work that we're doing is very comprehensive and it is multifaceted. But we are committed to making sure that this continued focus is taking place so that we can ensure that all of our students are prepared to reach their full potential 
and at the same time acquire the portrait of a graduate out attributes that we are committed to. Another key strategy for developing those portrait of a graduate outcomes is the use of project-based learning. You saw some examples in the video at a couple of schools where students were engaged in a couple of those learning experiences. Project-based learning is, is a teaching method which students are gaining knowledge and skills by working in an extended period of time to investigate and or respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question problem or challenge. There are many advantages we're seeing to project-based learning. First, we're seeing that students become more engaged in learning when they have a chance to dig into those complex and challenging, sometimes even messy problems you saw in the video, um, and that those problems are related closely to what's happening in real life or what will happen in their real life, not simply learning facts and then taking a test to state that we've received those facts. Students in project-based learning settings are required to become active learners who must use critical thinking skills to solve those problems. Again, the, one of our portrait of a graduate attributes. Project-based learning can also inspire students to gain a deeper understanding and appreciation for the subject at hand and develop real interests in diving into that subject and gaining more knowledge rather than, again, just being given facts. Additionally, a growing body of academic research supports the use of project-based learning in school to engage our students, to also reduce absenteeism, and also to be able to bo boast those critical and creative thinking skills that we know are necessary in this ever-changing world. We believe that project-based learning is truly an efficient instructional strategy for teaching both content and skills simultaneously and while also supporting students to develop those portrait of a graduate skills. As you can see from this slide, we've trained many teachers in project-based learning. Currently, over 1,100 teachers have been trained and we are working on increasing our capacity to offer additional training to meet the growing number of requests from schools. I think it's important though to point out that our project-based learning work has really been a grassroots type of implementation. There have been no mandates or requirements associated with this strategy. Instead, the division has provided only opportunities and support to schools. Of course, as we consider ensuring that all of our students are being provided those opportunities to engage in this type of learning, we do need to uh, deepen our understanding of how to best implement this across the division. So to that end, what we have begun this year is to form a pilot of cohort of schools, kindergarten through 12th grades, so elementary, middle, and high, with a focus on project-based learning innovation. ISD is working closely with the schools listed on this slide to create a culture where teachers can implement those portrait of a graduate skills, uh, project-based learning model, and then ultimately enhance those portrait of a graduate skills. This cohort of schools is also helping us to see how the successes and challenges that are taking place can inform effective systemic change for us to be able to scale this work across the division. The picture you see on this slide illustrates the importance of this work. Here we see an ESOL student at Herndon Middle School who designed a vehicle that could explore a special location. She actually created a full blueprint of the whole vehicle then she made a model of that one section showing how the parts of that vehicle would move. It included how the forces affected their vehicle's movement, the importance of measurement, and simple and complex machines. All of this learning she did was done through technology using our JSON.org modules. And then at the end of this project, she presented it to an audience of over 60 people. This is the type of learning that we're truly aimed at focused on, helping students to connect, get excited, and apply those skills in a meaningful way. The second desired outcome in strategy one focuses on working to close the achievement gap. As we all know, there is no one silver bullet for closing the achievement gap. There are numerous factors associated with gaps in achievement across all of our student groups. And as a result, the supports and resources necessary to close those, close those gaps are many. 
FCPS has created a research-based plan for addressing the achievement gap, which serves as a resource for all of our schools. This plan, as you can see, is composed of strategies related to the drivers on this screen, on this slide, of academic support, relationships, college and career readiness, school and family, access to rigor, and ready to learn. Since 2014, all of our schools have closing achievement gap goals and strategies in their school improvement and innovation plans. And while a lot of exceptional work has been done in our schools, the gaps in student achievement do continue to persist and are an area of focus for us. Given the realities of our existing resources, we've had to take a very intentional approach to supporting our schools and their closing achievement gap efforts. So what we've done to that end is to focus on supporting a select number of pilot projects in each of the drivers you see on this slide each year. Our intention is to learn more on how we can best maximize our support for this work centrally so that we can help schools identify best practices and strategies that they can scale up and use across the division and certainly across the school. One very successful closing achievement gap strategy that the board has um, heard about in a previous work session is that, and that we've now recently scaled across the division, is the new high school ESOL programming. In 2015-16 school year, we piloted this new ESOL programming to provide our English learners with the ability to accelerate their English development and put them on a true path towards graduation. What happened at this program? Well, students receive sheltered instruction in the content courses for standard graduation credits. The courses that they take are enriched with English language development, targeting, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Students who are new to the US, they receive comprehensive supports to help them create a welcoming, warm, and safe environment in which to learn. Some of our students come to us not have ever been in school ever in their life, and they may be in middle or high school. The pilot program that we did saw great successes at Lee and Stewart High School. Some of those successes included 564 English language level one, two, and three students receiving an English credit towards graduation. 228 level one and two students receiving a social studies credit for government. And 91 students receiving an algebra one after a double block of mathematics. When you, why is that so important? Why is that a success? Because in comparison, our ESOL level one and two students at all of our other high schools last year did not take those courses and as a result could not earn those standard credits towards graduation. But as a result of the success we saw last year at Lee and Stewart, we have now scaled that new ESOL high school program to design to all of our high schools this school year. And we are working with the Office of Program Evaluation which is providing us with further analysis of the outcomes of this new model. So again, this is one example of a resource and a strategy and a variety of best practices that we are putting to pla in place in a pilot and then ultimately then being able to scale division-wide. Clearly, much more needs to be done when we look at the data for our English language learners and some of our students that are not yet meeting um, proficiency. We are taking additional steps also to better support the 35,000 English learners in our schools. We know that administrators and teachers need additional knowledge and skills in order to work effectively with our English learners and their families. So to that end, in 2015-16 school year, the Office of ESOL Services introduced EL Innovation. EL Innovation is a targeted professional development series in which school teams gain an understanding of those instructional strategies to help EL students and help develop skills to implement English language development standards and programming for the needs of those students. School teams who participate examine their needs and create an innovation plan that incorporates these strategies to impact teaching and learning for English learners. To date, over 40 of our schools have participated in EL Innovation and have created plans towards helping support those English learners. Additionally, 
in 2017, 2018, the Office of ESOL Services will be introducing ESOL program standards for all of our elementary and middle schools. The standards that will be rolled out will provide all school administrators in every school and all teachers with the specific components, tools, strategies, and structures that they are needed to create an effective program for our English learners. Another way that we're addressing closing the achievement gap is responsive instruction. Responsive instruction is a multi-tiered system of supports through which school teams can make data-based instructional decisions for students who have those individual needs in order to match those to the necessary academic in some cases, behavior, or student wellness supports in some cases, all of those, in order to ensure that that student has success. And our schools that are implementing responsive instruction, what they do is they use a collaborative problem-solving approach to build a continuum of, of, of a variety of strategies to help them think about what interventions are needed, what supports are needed, and how do we address the needs of the particular student that is at their uh, school. So it's looked at individually, and then certain them, some of them are looked at the whole group. We continue to expand RI implementation through professional development opportunities, and we're working to make sure that we provide individual school support on topics such as problem solving, goal setting, progress monitoring, and resource mapping. The, re the RI process is data driven, and that's the major area of focus as we think about how to be close the achievement gap, we have to look specifically at the data. And therefore the RI team in collaboration with our IT department, collaboration with instructional services, have developed an expanded functionality in EDSL, which is our division's data management system to help support schools and teachers with meeting those individual needs of their students. This tool supports schools as they analyze that data, whether it's academic or behavioral, and then helps them to facilitate a problem-solving approach to have those conversations that are needed to then provide the supports and interventions that students need, while at the same time monitor their progress. At the start of this school year, the RI functionality in EDSL has ex been expanded to include a secondary view and numerous enhancements to support core instruction and intervention. This fall, a brand new tool called Foresight was launched to support transition and end of year planning for schools. So those are just a couple of the strategies we're doing division wide to help close the achievement gap. But again, we know much more needs to be done. The next outcome in strategy one is related to the use of technology. Over the past several years, you have heard much about, several months, you've heard much about our FCPS On initiative. The next several slides will highlight some of the important work that has been happening in this area. Technology use in education is no longer a luxury. We saw in the video the differences uh, between um, what schooling looked like then and what it looks like now. But it is really truly a requirement for us to reach our division's portrait of our graduate goals and to help students prepare them for their future, a future we don't even know what will look like. Although today's students are digital natives and many of them use iPhones and other, other tools for social networking, research clearly indicates that the majority of students are not capitalizing on the ability to use technology to enhance learning to apply complex technology skills to everyday challenges. Classrooms that prepare students with 20, 21st century skills seamlessly integrate technology into daily instruction, not replace, but integrate in a way that enhances and deepens students' learning. The quote you see here on this slide is from Mark Edwards, a nationally recognized leader in technology integration. As he states, students today must have digital learning environments that facilitate relevant personalized, collaborative, and connected learning experiences that drive student engagement, which in turn will drive student achievement. This uh, is a major area of our focus that is helping us as we think through FCPS on and ultimately supporting technology instruction across the division. Because we do believe that technology is so critical to student success, with the FCPS on as our pilot, 
This is helping us to look at how we can support students across the 15 schools that are in the pilot and then also ultimately expanding that division wide. On this slide, you can also see the excitement of the third graders at Brookfield Elementary who are getting ready to take laptops home for the first time in October. Prior to their inclusion in FCPS on, 114 students at Brookfield reported not having any technology or any internet access outside of school. And however, we do want to stress that FCPS non is not just about giving a laptop, it's not just about having internet, it's also about making sure that we use that technology to provide students with dynamic learning experiences that help prepare them for portrait of a graduate in the future. Of course, we know this will require a multi-year commitment to support our schools in the implementation of the actual devices, but we're committed to looking at the learning and the instruction that needs to take place to make that happen. We've established benchmarks for success and we're learning a lot about the positive impact of one-to-one -one technology in our pilot schools. Moreover, we are working with John Hopkins University to study deeply the benefits and the challenges of this type of work and John Hopkins will be coming to a board work session later on in the spring to provide you with an update on that work. To highlight the importance of increased access, we have two stories we'd like to share. First, Day Leary, an English teacher at Falls Church High School, tells of the real impact that giving the gift of technology access has on our students. And you can see on this slide what she had to say about a child who, quote, about this time, one kid called me over to say he had logged on and wasn't sure of next steps. I told him what I told other kids all afternoon. Great, put it in the bag, take it home. He paused and asked, really? I get it to take it home, really? Are you sure? And then I get to do schoolwork on it, really? I answered yes each time, smiling and trying not to get tears in my eyes. He gingerly put the laptop in his bag and then walked out hugging it to his chest as though he had been given the most important treasure. When students have access to technology, they can truly engage in true learning anytime and anywhere. And again, it's not simply about having the device. Looking at the student tweet on this slide, we see a strong example of how technology can change the time, place, and path of student learning as a Chantilly High School student tweets about using FaceTime and Google Docs in the airport during Thanksgiving travel. Here's the story according to her teacher at Chantilly High School, Katie Van Nuys. World history students were working in groups about the effects of the printing press. Students who were absent were going to have to complete the assignment independently at the, another time. One student was worried about having to write her project without any support from her peers, so she asked if she could FaceTime and collaborate with her other classmates on Google Docs while at the airport. Using this technology, she was able to contribute to the class discussion and her group assignment, even though she was in the airport traveling for Thanksgiving. Getting all of our students one-to-one -one access is critically important for our school division and making sure that that learning is connected to the use of technology. And this is another area we believe, if we invest in, will help us to close the achievement gap. While we are just in our first year of FCPS on, we are seeing examples of the positive impact of this work in helping our students develop those portrait of a graduate skills. For example, classroom environments have been transformed into student-centered learning spaces. You can see some of the examples on this slide. Technology is being used to connect FCPS students with professional experts and students around the world. Again, that global citizenship helping to support those collaborative learning environments and helping them develop communication skills through technology and not simply with the person sitting next to you. Middle and high school students have been given opportunities to take leadership roles and act as student tech aides to support their fellow students with technology issues. Again, developing collaboration and helping students to develop a skill that they can use moving forward. The student tech aides work hand in hand with T-SPECs and our teachers for a unique real world hands-on learning opportunity. One example of a teacher using technology to enhance their instructional practice 
comes from Mary Kay Downs, an English teacher at Chantilly High School, who says, quote, we use the laptops daily. We have totally and completely eliminated paper in my classroom. It is so much easier to give students immediate feedback now. And as I have been teaching since 1965, I think I can be an example of the fact that age has no bearing on educational innovation. On November 16th, instructional transformation teams from our FCPS on schools came together for a day of professional development. Teachers and instructional leaders were asked to share top successes and challenges in their school. Here are just a few I'd like to share with you. Franklin Middle School, quote, we use technology to empower student learning. Teachers are included as learners as they view themselves as lifelong learners. Students are afforded choice in how they access and demonstrate learning. Technology provides students with opportunities of learning, problem solving, particularly with research. Again, what we're seeing in our FCPS on is a very powerful connection with learning and not what's happening in some of the other districts who have simply given out devices for students and teachers to use. As technology usage becomes ubiquitous in student learning, it is imperative that we are providing students, parents, and staff the knowledge and skills necessary to be productive and responsible digital citizens. And that is our fourth desired outcome in strategy one. Our digital citizenship plan emphasizes school and home partnerships. We believe that providing a sustained effort to educate school staff and parents will result in our students developing more safe, ethical, and responsible online behaviors, and also helping them to develop a pos positive digital identity. To this end, we have taken a number of actions, including the following I'd like to share with you. We have sponsored Digital Citizenship Week as an opportunity for increased awareness and education, shared a variety of resources, including lesson plans, and also social media posts were provided to schools for this event. And 67.1% of our schools planned activities that week for schools, staff, parents, and others to help them become aware of digital citizenship skills and many are reporting additional activities planned for this year. Digital citizenship information was also provided to over 100 parents that stopped by the booth at the recent mental health conference. Parents were able to talk with staff and ask questions, as well as pick up sample device contracts and family media agreements in their native languages. In addition, each year we see more and more schools and pyramids hosting events to provide awareness and strategies for family engagement. To address staff education, nine new teacher training modules are now available in the area of digital citizenship. Since the release of these materials in October of this year, over 1,500 modules have been completed by teachers. These modules are helping to train staff on how they can better support digital citizenship. And while this training currently is optional for our teachers, it will, be it will be completed and required next year by all of our instructional staff. And finally, an online course designed for parents and their children is being planned for the 2017-2018 school year to help them better understand digital citizenship. Our last um, desired outcome in strategy one is related to providing centralized support for schools based on student achievement needs. This is an area you've heard much about, Project Momentum, as it is a key strategy for providing centralized support to our schools. And I know that you've recently had a work session where we've talked about Project Momentum. As a result of this, we've seen significant increases in student achievement in our Project Momentum schools. For example, 15 of our 18 Project Momentum schools met English state targets, and 16 of the 18 met math state targets. As you can see, there are many associated metrics for strategy one. Many of these represent data that we have looked at over time. So you have some familiarity as we've looked at it in some of our work sessions and others are new. However, we will have more time at our January work session to really dig into the data, 
but I will provide a few high-level overview graphs of some of the key metrics, not every single one on this slide, so that we can really move forward and get into that deeper conversation at the work session. The first one, though, I'd like to highlight is this, the graph representing grade three reading SOL data by ethnicity. Though the overall pass rate remained constant, as you can see, the pass rate for our Hispanic students has increased by 4% with slight changes experienced by our black and white students. When looking at grade three reading data by subgroup, each group showed some improvement, English learners by 1%, economically disadvantaged students, 2%, students with disabilities, 5%. These changes are improvements, but they're slight progress, and we wanna continue to make sure that we're investing our time and resources in some of the things I previously talked about so that we're not seeing just slight improvement. We wanna see dramatic improvement and actually close that gap. Though all of the subgroups, as you can see on this slide, have increased their percent passing and reading over the past four years, you can also see on this slide that performance gaps continue to exist. And we must continue to address the needs, as you can see on this slide, of our black and Hispanic students through our literacy, our responsive instruction efforts, and some of the other things that were outlined earlier in my presentation. The algebra, the percentage of students successfully completing algebra one by eighth grade overall and by subgroup has shown a very slight decrease and it is an area we need to pay attention to. In addition, as you can see, the percentage of economically disadvantaged and English language learner students completing algebra one by eighth grade has also shown a slight decrease while students with disabilities remain flat. So clearly much work needs to be done in this area to close that gap. Though all subgroups, as you can see on this slide, have increased their percent passing in math over the past five years, performance gaps continue to exist. And once again here you see that we must continue to address the needs of our black and Hispanic students through our mathematics and responsive instruction efforts. And again, these are areas where we saw some success, but we're not where we need to be, and we certainly have not closed that gap. In the area of our English language learners on this slide, you can see some success here and also some challenges. WIDA access for ELLs is the federally required annual English language proficiency assessment given to English learners in Fairfax County and throughout Virginia. What WIDA measures is the student's ability to read, write, listen, and speak in English. VDOE establishes new progress targets and will be establishing new progress targets to align with the new test and ESSA regulations in 2017. But what you can see on the chart above is the percentage of our English learners who met 2010 progress targets on two consecutive WIDA exams. VDOE is using improvement in scaled scores that vary depending on the student's English proficiency level in order for us to, excuse me, to me measure progress. It should be noted that VDOE has not used these metrics to measure school divisions since 2015 because of the changes happening with No Child Left Behind and now what we will be waiting to see with ESSA. But you can see beginning in 2014, and, and as you are well aware through previous conversations, a higher percentage of newcomer students have enrolled in our high schools with significant academic and social emotional needs. And these students are requiring more time and attention to help make these progresses. That is why we've implemented the high school innovation at the high school level that we talked about previously in my presentation. In addition, the WIDA access for ELL assessment has undergone content and administration changes since 2015 including moving from paper and pencil to an online format. Another uh, metric that I'd like to highlight in our strategy one is the percentage of students who passed at least one AP, IB, or dual enrollment course. And as you can see on this slide, our data remains fairly consistent with only a slight change for our Asian students, but relatively constant for the last three years. 
For our next area, looking at <clears throat> the percent of graduates passing at least one in industry credential test, since 2014, there has been a significant increase in the percentage of students we see passing at least one test. Our current seniors who entered ninth grade in 2013-14 are the first class that is required to earn an industry credential for a standard diploma. And while approximately about three-fourths of our graduates earn an advanced studies diploma and are not required to earn a credential for that diploma, more than 75% of them are doing that, even though they're not required. The largest number of industry certifications we see are in workplace readiness, wise financial literacy, and yet there's a wide variety of certifications students are taking, including state licensing credentials in fields such as health and medical sciences and cosmetology. And we're looking forward to the changes that are happening at the state level with regards to the high school SOL requirements because we hopefully then can incorporate some of those as replacements and we're looking forward to those changes. But while we see positive stuff here, we are also continuing to focus on making sure we give students the opportunity to prepare and pass for industry credentials that are related to their course content and hopefully for future career. The next metric is looking at the area of on-time graduation. While the on-time graduation rates for FCPS continue to be well above the Virginia average and na national averages, it is critical for us to make sure we continue to focus on the graduation rates for all of our subgroups and not just look at the whole number. For the class of 2016, you can see there was a 3% th increase for black students, a 1.3% increase for Asian, and a 2.5% decrease for Hispanic students, with the rest of our subgroups remaining consistent. This slide and the following slides indicate that there continue to be the most significant gaps for our Hispanic students and English learners compared to any other subgroup in our division. And again, that is why we highlight, I highlighted the work that's taking place and has just begun now that was piloted at Lee and Stewart to go division-wide. For the class of 2016, you see, there was more than a 3% increase in on-time graduation for students who are identified as economically disadvantaged and an approximately 1% decrease for those English language learners, while students with disabilities remained relatively consistent. Again, the enhanced secondary ESOL programming is a, our specific effort aimed to increase support for our students towards on-time graduation rates and preparation for post, post high school, college, or career. And you saw just from the numbers that I shared with you from Stuart and Lee, what, will ha what can happen division-wide once we begin to make sure that this is implemented across the division. We now move to strategy two. We're almost through. This strategy is focused on the role of assessment, and there are three desired outcomes, including the need for a balanced assessment system, data tools that will allow school staff to meet individual needs, and our approaches to grading and homework which I know has been a discussion at the board table and will continue to be. Okay. The first outcome we'll look at is related to balance assessment. When we talk about a system that is balanced, what do we mean by that? We mean that we're balancing the measurement of both what and how students are learning. For example, we want to see the balance of the measurement of both content and those skill acquisition that we're expecting of students. And we want to also use a balanced assessment, a variety of, of forms to, from multiple choice to performance-based assessment tasks. That also is in line with what the state is looking at at the SOL Innovation Committee and the changes under ESSA. For the past several years, the school board and leadership team have discussed the need to have a more complete picture than those slides I just previously showed you, which simply show pass rates on SOL. And so one way in which we can do that is looking at, again, both content and skill assessment. This diagram on this slide represents our current thinking about how we might be able to provide such a picture for the board and not just have SOL rates. The role of multiple choice assessments under No Child Left Behind has clearly dominated our data collection for many, many years and has truly been the main form. 
And it is now time for us to commit and ESSA and at the state level are also moving in this direction once again to add additional assessment types that will allow us to more fully understand students, their depth of understanding, their development of skills, and not simply their ability to answer a multiple choice test. In the balanced framework proposed on this slide, multiple choice assessments measuring content do continue to play an important role, and you see that on the far left side. SOLs, SATs, ACTs, for example, will still matter and do still matter. However, they would not be the only types of assessments that we would use for measuring student learning. For example, we believe that performance-based measures, which are projects or tasks, and you saw some of that again in the video, and I highlighted some of that earlier in the previous strategy, those types of measures require students to use higher level thinking to either perform, to create, or produce something, similar to the, the uh, middle school student from Herndon, and actually apply that in an authentic or real world way. We believe that performance-based assessments are much better as instruments for measuring students' skills in portrait of a graduate than a multiple choice exam. These types of assessments are already taking place in many of our classrooms. The use of performance-based assessments has been an, an area of emphasis for instructional services, and we're currently working with schools to increase this type of tasks and how students and teachers can better use these. The final box on the, on the diagram represents the authentic examples of student work we would like to see. We hope this will be captured through the development and implementation of capstone projects at grades three, five, eight, and 10, or 11 in the future. Currently, we're working with the number of schools to pilot the co-development of these types of experiences for the students this school year. And further, we believe that having this type of a variety of evidence of learning will lend itself to the creation of student portfolios you saw an example of that on the video. And it will also help for us to be able to provide a more comprehensive view of individual student achievement over time and not simply once at one point during the year as they take a multiple choice assessment. Ultimately, a random sampling of these portfolios across the division will help us division-wide look at data and allow for us to understand the complete picture of student achievement in FCPS. But I want to reiterate the rumors that it's not replacing SOLs and, and replacing multiple choice, it's making it a comprehensive approach and you can see on this slide the balance to that. A lot of rumors about what's happening in this area. As the implementation of performance-based assessments increases, our portrait of a graduate rubrics are another resource that is being used widely by teachers and students in FCPS. As you can see on this slide, these rubrics are again just another instrument, not the only, but of measurement, but another important instrument to help inform the understanding of what student development on each attribute might look like over time. These rubrics, as you can see, are broken down by each of our portrait of a graduate attributes at grade band, and they also offer teachers the opportunity to select the appropriate criteria for that particular assessment. But most importantly, these resources have changed the role of the student in the assessment process. And I think this is probably the most exciting because the quote at the center of this slide provided by one of our teachers articulates the impact of giving students the opportunity to self-assess. And this teacher says, students were able to reflect in a structured way. My students understood what behaviors or actions to strive for and we're able to set goals to continue and change behaviors in the future. That's ultimately what we want for our students, for them to be able to own their own learning, own their own understanding, and make goals towards the progress that they need to make to become more successful. Currently, our intention again, similar to what I mentioned earlier, has not been to require the use of these rubrics, but simply to offer them as a resource to help teachers embed those portrait of a graduate attributes in their current content assessments and to help enrich their teaching and learning experiences. Not a mandate, a resource to help our students and teachers. 
The second desired outcome in strategy two focuses on the need to provide teachers and administrators with the tools necessary to monitor student learning. This year, in an effort to more efficiently respond to our school's data needs, we formed a new interdepartmental team, which we call the DDCT, or Division Data Collaboration Team. This team has membership from the Office of Student Testing, our Department of Student Services, Information Technology, and Instructional Services. This team is supporting our schools with the needs related to data and helping them to access student achievement data as well as providing comprehensive training on data literacy and instructional improvement planning. And just this year alone, and this has only been in place since September, the DDCT has already assisted over 60 schools with setting up new, more efficient data monitoring systems. This team since September has helped create division-wide level dashboards that help schools monitor their SOL history. Since September, this team has provided approximately 100 schools with new analytics for monitoring language development skills and needs of their ESOL students. This team has provided comprehensive data analysis reporting and trained all of our Project Momentum schools and has trained 149 schools on the new responsive instruction data functionality that I previously mentioned in the last strategy. When we discuss the need to provide tools to monitor student learning, perhaps nothing is more important than the early identification of our students who are at risk for difficulties in reading and math. To meet this need efficiently and effectively, we, as the board is aware, we have selected a universal screen tool that we're currently piloting called iReady to help support our schools in the responsive instruction process by helping provide data, progress monitor, and also some intervention resources that are connected to that data to our elementary and middle school students. Currently, this pilot is in 15 elementary schools. Early feedback from these schools is positive in terms of the data we're seeing and seems to be consistent with other data sources, yet we're continuing to monitor this pilot to see how that information will be useful and valuable for planning instruction, planning instruction, intervention, and helping with teacher workload in this area. Teachers have definitely expressed appreciation of the aligned resources for meeting those individual student needs. And as we've gone out as a team to visit those schools and see, and I first time have gone and see and talked to students, they're very, very excited about this program. Data from the pilot year will be used to help determine the impact on achievement and help us to inform our division-wide plan to see how we might scale this across for all of our elementary and middle schools next school year. The final outcome in strategy two is related to the evaluation of student learning and focuses on division grading and homework practices, an area I know the board has been involved in and we will continue to discuss moving forward. I don't know what happened to the, can you bring the slide back, the, the um, presentation up? As you are aware, I might have hit it too many times, apologize. As you are aware, we made some changes this year to our middle and high school grading regulation this year. After much consideration and involvement of our stakeholder groups, changes were made to increase consistency among our schools and ensure that grades reflected student learning. An overarching theme of the change was to promote learning environments where students had an opportunity to demonstrate proficiency and are also motivated to make continuous efforts to improve. In the area of separating work habits and achievement, you can see the emphasis was placed on the elimination of grades that are based on a student's behavior and to record only grades that provide evidence of learning. These changes included updates in regulation, such as class participation, homework, and late work. Another major change in this area was the requirement for students to be able to have a second chance in demonstrating proficiency on a major assessment if they did not meet the score of 80% or higher on the first attempt. This has been the most challenging change for teachers to implement and we're continuing to support them and they are continuing to work on this in collaborative teams to refine this in implementation. 
finally, the updated regulation supports efforts to limit the use of zero in a 100 point scale. For example, both implementing a more lenient late work policy and encouraging no lower grade than 50% if reasonable work is completed will likely result in less zeros being given. We recognize though that this is an area we still have inconsistency amongst our schools and although we do believe that we've made some right steps in this direction, it's certainly an area we need to continue to work at. Significant work has been done centrally and at the school level to ensure teachers continue to be supported in implementing these new changes. And we're continuing at the division level to monitor the implementation of this and work with leadership teams and school board will determine the next appropriate steps on what we do in this area. We know it's one of a lot of discussion. But in addition to grading, there's also been much, much happening behind the scenes in the area of effective homework practices. Principals and teacher leader groups have been engaged in examining current regulations and providing input on how to in initiate division-wide attention and action in this area. The consensus has been to begin this process at the school level and therefore resources are being worked out to create school staffs and provide them with the, the needed opportunities to reflect in conversations and examine their own current practice with the intent then to ensure that homework is purposeful and that consideration is being given to school and life balance. I can say this is just the beginning of this work and we recognize the need for increased division expectations moving forward in the area of homework. So the work that I've outlined in quite a long time here in talking to you is just a little bit of the, what's happening in strategies one and two is very important part of our strategic plan. Probably the majority of our strategic plan happens in, in goal one and you only heard about two parts tonight. But division-wide, I do wanna let the board know that we are continuing to align our work to support these outcomes and the actions of our portrait of a graduate in our constant daily conversations and what we're doing. And while there is more work to be done, and we do have some areas, particularly in the achievement gap, there is much to celebrate and there is much to be proud of in the innovation and the approach to learning that's taking us from the then to the now that you saw in this video. Goal one of the strategic plan is truly assisting us in ensuring that we do the following. We must reach, we must challenge, and we must prepare every one of our students, not just to pass a test, but to be successful in college, career, or simply in life. And that is what we're all about in FCPS. And what's happening in this area of our strategic plan is how we use our blueprint for making that a reality for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duran. Um, I have a few questions. Of course, we're gonna have a work session on this in um, January. Um, first, we go to uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Schultz. Some water. <laughs> so I'm just gonna, it's very hard to synthesize that amount of information, um, but um, a couple of things that I wanted to um, identify. Um, when you were talking about the online dyslexia handbook, yes, um, is that is that something that is a tool for just the educators, or is that educators and parents? And how does that compare to? Well, is that intended to be a handbook um, for parents of students who've already been identified as dyslexic? or who may suspect their children are dyslexic? I mean, I, Yes, I, so I, it is intended to support teachers and also parents, and it is really, to, it'll be comprehensive so that it will have elements for parents and students and teachers who already have students identified, but also for parents who may not be aware or aren't sure. So is it gonna be like a reference guide, like if you're, if you are experiencing, or if you're, if your student mm -hmm. is exhibiting these you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, so it's a, just a top level thing. It will have, it will be more holistic. It will have some top level, but also some specific areas too. I mean, I'm confused whether, it, I mean, it, it's unusual for us to have a kind of a reference that's both intended for educators and parents. Usually the information that we provide to parents is, is utterly different than a professional development tool. 
meant to guide or train? No, it's not meant to be a professional development tool or guide or train, but it is also uh, meant to help parents and teachers look, what are some of the look-fors that the students may have? Uh, no, no, it's, not, it's, it, it, it's yeah. all right, Dr. Prasidi. I'm just gonna say, when we have our work session, I'm probably gonna have uh, some more questions okay. about that. Absolutely. And what is the status of the screener again? The universal screener is being piloted in 15 schools, and so what we must do then after the end of the pilot is with the state, um, send that data to show that what we're seeing correlates to our DRA and is getting the same bit of information that our DRA, so we should have all that done so that we would be able to then scale it up division-wide next school year. Do you know what those 15 schools are or how they were picked? Yes, um, I believe we had we had previously sent. I can send that to you, but right. there are three in each region. Okay, and they were chosen by interest of the schools. So we asked schools to apply. Okay, that sounds familiar. We wanted to make sure that we had a comprehensive. So we had some large, some small, okay. some higher performing, some in project momentum. We also wanted to make sure that schools were interested because they had to give both the DRA and the right. uh, universal screener. Okay. So we asked schools that were interested. And then on the literacy instruction piece that you had in strategy one, yes, um, this is something I, I, I don't know if it's just a vernacular issue, but you know I hear we talk a lot about literacy, but then you all of a sudden you were switching to middle school and high school as if the focus of literacy was middle school and high school, and I was confused where where sort of that third, you know the benchmark of you know reading by third grade and the the flip of learning to read to reading to learn and where the emphasis is on writing um, and it's a, a consistent question that's actually um, with a, a greater degree of velocity picking mm -hmm. up from parents um, tremendously concerned about the fact that um, students are not writing and, and not and not just not writing um, comprehensively, but just writing on a regular basis um, that it, we're still very heavy worksheet driven um, and that the acquisition of writing skills, both in handwriting, um, I, I still don't know where we are on handwriting, on handwriting and then the application of handwriting and what that does to, you know, fine motor skill development mm -hmm. and then the ability to write critically, um, you know, it, it sort of just kind of gets faded to the back when we just say literacy. So where are we yeah. a little bit on writing? So um, the area of writing is definitely an area of focus for us. And in fact, our literacy symposium that we held this past summer that I highlighted, that was the focus was on writing, writing instruction. And so for the high school and the middle school teams that came, they were looking at writing across all the contents, so science teachers, music teachers, PE teachers, how do they incorporate. So writing is definitely an area that we have seen is a need for us to provide more emphasis, and that is actually what our focus was this past summer in the literacy symposiums. Literacies, reading, writing, speaking, and, and writing was an area that we noted was major. But as opposed to just a symposium, it, w w are you, is there a deeply embedded? Well, I know? only mentioned the symposium because that's what I was highlighting when I meant, when you asked about how I went from elementary to middle. So that was one professional development way, um, avenue that we use. And then certainly as we looked at our language arts, planning and pacing guides, that is something that is being embedded into them as well, the writing instruction and references to that. So it's certainly an area that we're looking in the resources we're providing, whether they be t you know, tangible resources, but then also the type of professional development we're providing has to also match that as well. And so what I was highlighting was the professional development that we had done. And, and is that being, um, I, I don't know about, so there's one thing f for instructional services to provide um, you know, curriculum materials or, pro mm -hmm. or uh, um, uh, Resources and support. Resources. It's another thing to talk about fidelity. And, and is there is there a system, and I don't know, maybe this is for Dr. Lockhart or- If or I could Dr. maybe just yeah. add a few clarifying comments of really about the strategy that we're using mm -hmm. for this work. So the frameworks that we referenced on the PowerPoint slides are the resources to support the practice in the classrooms. But we're really taking a job embedded professional development mm -hmm. approach, uh, particularly at the secondary level 
where each school principal selected a team of content area teachers from right. their school that would be the leaders of this work. Right. And we provide professional development and resources for them to take back to their colleagues. Um, and we're working with them on an ongoing basis. So we worked with them during the summer and then we bring them back several months later. We'll bring them back several months later again into the spring. And you know, if we continue to have the funding, we'll continue to do that work with them in the summer again. And the focus really is getting them the resources and materials to work with their colleagues in their professional learning communities, in their CLTs where it's closest to their work. Okay. And the writing, as you said, is a focus of our work. Mm -hmm. That disciplinary literacy that includes not just reading, but writing. And we want our students writing across the content areas, particularly at the secondary level. Okay, so that's, that was really the, that yeah, was the okay. answer that I was really looking for. So that's, you know, that's been a focus of mine for, for quite a while. And then where are we on that, handwriting? Because that's the other question that I get. Um, and, you know, the, the, the fidelity of, of that from building to building um, is really a question because really kind of, it's, it's almost like an educator shrug at this point, like, eh, they don't need to learn to write. As long as they can learn to type, that's all that matters. And there's a real, like mm -hmm. there's a significant angst growing in, you know, parent populations of saying, you know, my child can't read a birthday card from me because they're not learning to write themselves. Mm. So they don't even recognize letters and cursive handwriting. And so, you know, not only the fine motor development, but um, the, the fundamental skill of being able to write um, I, I know this is sort of like a, a basics, you know, writing, reading, arithmetic question, but it, it's really imperative. Okay. So I, I would just say it continues to be an area I, I think that we can discuss, obviously, as a, as a community. Um, handwriting itself is not required by the state, so we have not, we've chosen right. not to require it in FCPS. However, we do have resources and materials that we make available to schools, and many teachers and many schools do use them. But to your point, we're not requiring them so they're not being used consistently across the school system. So if we wanted to require it, it would be exceeding the state SOQ? Yes. yes. Well, we do that in a lot of other areas that maybe are a little less significant. Um, so how would we broach that as a board? I, am I forced to take that to a forum or can we have that discussion at a work session or? How, how do we how do we have that more in depth conversation? I think we can follow up more. I mean, okay. the first step is to talk more. I mean, we certainly can talk more in the in the work session coming up in January. We can talk more individually with board members, and you know, that's can obviously be an ongoing conversation. Okay, yeah. I'd like to have that noted okay. for the record. And then I just have one last thing on the newcomer school. Um, can you bring up the slide? And I'm I, I apologize, I couldn't see slide numbers, and I, it was difficult to follow. But the slide that had the graduation rates by, um, okay. it, it was the chart with the unfortunate downhill slope. Yes, that one. So that's, I, I'm gonna tell you, that was of everything here. That was one of the most surprising ones to me, um, notably because typically students with disabilities is actually at the bottom um, in terms of achievement. So the fact that we have students at, uh, with disabilities usually at the bottom of achievement, but far exceeding um, economically disadvantaged um, and super far exceeding um, English uh, language learners, I, I, I'm surprised by that. I'm also surprised by the downturn slope in um, the newcomers, and I'm, or the, the English language learners, and I'm wondering if that's because we've had a significant increase in newcomers to Fairfax County. Does that reflect the downturn? In, and th I'm assuming that's the, the, we don't get relief, so we still have four years to graduate somebody? Well, oh, no, actually with English learners, you do have, um, they may take longer than four years and they can still count towards that, but, Part of what you're seeing here is we have not yet seen all the changes that we put in place with the ESOL programming at the secondary high school. So those put in place, that, that starts in the ninth grade. So we're still gonna see for a couple of years some of this type of data. 
because, again, when students prior to us putting these changes in, a student in ninth grade was taking an ESOL class that wasn't accounting for a standard English graduation credit. They weren't able to attain at the same rate as their peers the um, algebra and the also the well, government that credits. So that, that explains the gap between the line at the bottom and the lines above it. Yes. But it doesn't explain the downward trend in the in the line. Well, because again, when you're looking at English learners coming in, they're dip, we're getting a lot of new students, so it's not a consistent necessarily group year to year. Mm. We, it's a different population each year. It's not the same population you have for four years necessarily. You do get a large number of students who come in, maybe in junior year, senior year, that weren't with us for that four years as well. So that population is, is a this, little bit different to compare to some of the others. Is passing the WIDA, um, th is the requirement to pass the WIDA a part of the graduation rate? No. Mm -mm. No. No. Because mm -hmm. there's a disparity between the kids that pass the SOL and the ones who pass the WIDA, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would I would remind us as we look at that chart over the last five years though that the state had increased graduation requirements um, and we had a different set of graduation requirements for each graduating right. class. Um, so I think part of what you're seeing in terms of the decline is the disproportionate impact of increased graduation requirements, additional credits that students had to earn right. on English language learners along with the trend that you that you mentioned Ms. Schultz in terms of some of our students coming into the system at English level one and level two. Well, analytically speaking, I appreciate that, but that's an assumption. It is. Okay. It is. Yeah. It's an assumption. Sure. I mean, there's. I'd, I'd like to see the data behind the assumption that the students aren't graduating because of the exceeding. I, I think that probably your your assertion that that's a different set of students is probably a little Pardon. bit more likely. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Mrs. Strauss. First of all, thank you. This is a very rich and comprehensive report. Tremendous amount of information. Um, just a couple of things that struck me that uh, I found very valuable. The secondary literacy framework, mm -hmm. again, acknowledging, because very often we will see the concentration on a K-3 or a K-4. And we know that um, we have to make sure those literacy skills, uh, reading, writing, mm -hmm. the whole bit, it's all the way through high school. So uh, pacing guide and a framework for secondary education broken out in that way was, was, I was, it was a welcome piece. Universal screener, I'm very interested to see how that works out. I do have some schools in the pilot. Um, thank you for including a, a quote from Mary Kay Downs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of our, our wonderful senior teachers, and she's doing great with her, obviously her writing and mm -hmm. her classes at Chantilly and her total adoption of technology, yay Mary Kay. Um, Project-based learning, uh, uh, capstone projects, and then the plan for the assessments and the more balanced assessment. I have one question in the appendix. Um, you include the, the 2014 PISA reading performance. Are we still a part of that? What's going on with that? Because I know we had, a, we had a Gates Foundation grant. And yes, we're still we part of PISA and our high schools just finished completion of taking that and we should have the results from the most recent one in August. Wonderful, of this next? Of this, this coming August, we will have the results. They we just have the results. completed okay. taking them um, about two weeks ago, the last school Great. And again, it's a, um, uh, it's a um, statistical sampling of yes, students, right? Not everybody right. is, right, okay. 15 year olds. Right, as exactly. A, and is that again through the a grant opportunity? No, it's not through a grant opportunity. We do pay for, for that. We have to okay, I'll be. It's not every year. I think it's not every year. No. Other Every this other year. Matters. This will be a two, year, yeah, right. it's every but two we, years or something. Right, and right. we just completed this year's, this right. current 2016. school year. 2016. 2016, and we'll have results for that in August. Right, well, we'll look forward to that. It's always very interesting to see how we stack up. So, thank you. Ms. Hine? Thank you. Um, this is uh, a lot of great information, thank you, and I appreciate the time that you took. <laughs> I know it's not easy. Um, but, you know, this is the most important report, a type of report that I think we get on behalf of the community is what's happening in the classroom. That and the learning environments themselves. So I think we've had two really important um, conversations tonight. Um, as you said many times, we will continue to talk about achievement gaps and yes. we'll continue to work on those. So I just wanted to point out or ask one question uh, tonight on the slideshow. Um, slide 40, 
which is the um, continuing continuum of assessments one. Yes. Um, this is to me really exciting because mm -hmm. when I look at that, that does in one on one slide kind of pull together what the goal is, the balanced assessments and then pulling it all together in student portfolios, which makes a lot of sense so we can look over, over time. time. And, how, and then that, that line on the bottom, random sampling of student portfolios for accountability, that is so exciting mm -hmm. to me because we've talked for a while, you know, every kid, every year, every test is a ridiculous way to right. do accountability at our level, never mind the state level, right? So my question is, you, I think, are participating on the SOL um, yes, innovation. Yes, I'm a member of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you see the, uh, you see Virginia going toward this as a way to do accountability at the state level? Yes, we actually, we just had our, another meeting today, a conference call meeting today, and so at the high school, and we're right now looking at the high school assessments on the SOL Innovation Committee, and for social studies and science, we're considering right now having one of the assessments be a performance-based assessment. And then there's conversations currently around how we look at student work and other means, uh, whether it's a locally, um, ch whether it's locally driven or whether it's state driven. So, but yes, we are discussing this at the SOL innovation level. And I do think we will see some of this happening there. Okay, if there's anything I would just follow up. This came up the other night in our legislative session. Yes. Uh, where a board member there. mentioned, <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. <laughs> and you, so you saw we had a state board of ed member there mm -hmm. um, who pushed back and said, you know, that we, well, we do need to have accountability. And um, I'm, so, you know, he was just one member and it was not a full conversation, mm -hmm. but do you anticipate pushback on this sort of thing because Virginia, um, you know, so different from one end of the state well, to the other? Well, the, the board of ed, state board of ed has in their November meeting has already moved this forward that they're in support of it. I don't know if it was unanimous. I didn't see the, the vote and how that went, but I do know they've already moved this forward from the state board of ed and certainly the SL Innovation Committee today will be voting on it in January, but we all were in a consensus on the phone today of support and there are legislators on the SL Innovation Committee as well. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Darinette Kovic. Thank you, Dr. Duran, for this um, excellent presentation. There's a lot, as my colleagues are saying, to, to take in, and so I'm glad we're having a um, work session on this. I have a couple, hopefully, quick questions, though. Um, you mentioned the math planning and pacing guides, and they're being well received. So, are now all of our elementary schools offering? whatever we're calling it now, advanced or um, compacted math curriculum. Are they all offering advanced math? Well, as we are we're currently working on that, looking at, they are offering it in some ways. So what we're doing at the division level is we're looking to see how our school's offering it, what grades, how can we bring some more consistency. Right. The planning and pacing guide doesn't necessarily speak to advanced math per se in the way, you're, the question you're asking, I know what you're asking. So right now it is still something that we began to look at last year where we're identifying what each school at the elementary level is doing and how do we then bring some consistency division wide with some guidance on how they can offer advanced math. We also have to know that some schools have more resources in terms of teachers, that if the larger school, the smaller school, it's a little more difficult, the smaller number of students you may have at a school that may be uh, able to take advanced math makes it a little bit more difficult as well. So those are some of the, the variables that go into it, but currently I can't say that every single one division wide is doing it the same way in consistency, but we are working towards that, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I really enjoyed seeing the, the whole um, area where you're talking about in, in increasing project-based learning. I think yes, that's so same. very, very important. Um, and I know we do it pretty well in elementary schools. Are we continuing to do it at, at, as we go up the chain in middle schools and high schools? Are we working on that? Because a, as a parent, I, I, I saw a fall off on that as far as um, with, with both of my kids, and th that's just that parent mm -hmm. perspective, but I'm just, it, it seems as though it, it's something we do pretty well in that elementary school ye it, it years, and then not, we're not as consistent. Well, it's we definitely move. an area of focus for us, uh, K-12, and as I mentioned, the amount of teachers that have already been trained come from right. K-12, so okay. you're right that generally we tend to see elementary school, it's more natural there by the nature of being able to have the students all day and teachers that teach the, all the contents you know, to the students. So at the, element, at the middle and high school level, it's a little more of us helping to provide those ways that teachers might be able to infuse that into their instruction, 
So it is something that we at the division level are pushing K-12, and I think you'll see begin to see more and more of that as we have that training and as more and more teachers access that training. Good, I think that's, I think that's very important. Um, the ESOL programming, you know that was one of my um, really, I, I uh, felt there was a real need in my community mm -hmm. and I'm so glad that we've moved um, quickly beyond the pilot stage to across the, the high school curriculum. Um, and you know, I know we're still evaluating that mm -hmm. and I appreciate Ms. Schultz's comments <coughs> on, on, on you know, the, the needs of these, these students and how we're addressing them. I think this curriculum is going to go a long way and I think as we continue to modify and adjust as we take it um, full scale. Um, and of course, as we take it full scale, um, my next concern yeah. and desire and want would be that we look at a middle school program for this. I am definitely seeing a need in um, many of my schools to have that type of um, programming. And um, I, I know you're, you know, we're just there, but um, I know when we went and did our um, first look see at schools in Texas, which was mm -hmm. the first cohort of schools we looked at, and then I know the staff um, went well beyond that for the next year to look at best practices across um, uh, the country as far as, you know, e um, unique ESOL programming to compare to what we had originally had to enhance our programming. Um, but the, that cohort of school that we, the cohort of schools that we looked at when we were in Texas, um, they had it from fourth grade on, and um, we were looking at it at that time for you know, for those kids who are coming new to our area, who are the, between the ages of say 14 and 18. Um, but now we're seeing um, additional cohorts, I think, um, who who might benefit from this in the middle schools. So do we have any plans? And, and I will say that certainly we are, for, if you remember I mentioned the EL innovation, yes. the training for school teams, and also the ES, EL standards that are big going, moving forward for schools to have access. So what was unique about the high school program where we singled that out was the credits that right. students were needing to be okay. able to get that they weren't previously. So looking at that differently, but that did not mean we're negle neglecting middle school and elementary school in terms of providing instructional support and ways and strategies to help the adults who in some cases have not had English language learners or it's you know not large numbers of them. So we are working with them and will continue to work with them on instructional supports as well as thinking about some of the um, social and emotional supports through the counselors and some trainings with social workers and psychologists and looking at the needs that some of our ELL students bring when they come. Again, coming to this country never having been in a school ever and you're a sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth grader and you've never been in a classroom. That brings a whole other set of challenges. So we are definitely looking at, at both. It, the high school one was a little more specific because of the type of credit that we needed to make sure students were getting and change that right. so that they were able to get the English credit right. um, for their graduation and not be off track and you saw them so we don't see those same numbers. Okay. Well, I have more questions and, and comments about that, but I'll save those for okay. the work session on that program in particular. Thank you. Ms. Palachuk. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there's a lot there and, and I know we'll discuss more at the work session. Um, first of all, really appreciate the videos. Um, one thing I've been realizing this year is, you know, we, we protect our kids um, and in a way that makes it hard for the community and those of us yeah. here and outside of our schools to know what's happening and mm -hmm. to see it every day. So I hope we continue to find other innovative, innovative ways. I know you have an excellent team. Um, in our communication department and our IT department who, who are able to bring to life, right? Mm -hmm. These aren't just numbers and statistics no. and budget right. items aren't just budget items, they're the actually people, real right. life programs. Mm -hmm. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, next one also, the rubrics, I think one of my original concerns coming mm -hmm. in and seeing portrait of a graduate, I think we had this conversation, who's gonna build the rubrics, right? As a teacher, we know it's a lot on their plate. So I, I really appreciate the work that's going into um, creating that. Yes, so that they're able to focus on implementing it and working with the kids. Um, finally, and I think this is one of my um, newfound loves of our <laughs> school systems, I think a little known gem is our family literacy and early literacy program. Um, I love that you have it in there, um, that it's one of our family and community engagement mm -hmm. initiatives. Um, I know the times I've visited and families I've seen at schools have come up and said, please give us more, right? Please mm -hmm. give us the ability to expand our hours. Um, 
number of families we reach. I had one mom who came up and said to me, my daughter wasn't eligible for Head Start and I was really worried. Um, but when she started kindergarten, we'd gone through the family lit program, early lit, and she was just on track and did not need uh, additional intervention. So I know um, your team, Dr. Polio, I'm looking at you as well, work on this. So if there's anything we can mm -hmm. do to expand it, I know there are a lot of programs, even in the DC area, um, CASA has been doing work in PG County, the Flamboyant Foundation works in DC and Puerto Rico. Um, I think there's another program, Project Pl Flame, that have been doing this for a really, really long time. Um, and having worked as a community health promoter, it seems that that's one of the models that they're really starting to use as community promoters. So um, having people who are trained and then paid to be out in the community, working with families and bringing it back. So I know um, budgets are tight, but when we have these initiatives that, you know, we, we're doing a lot in the classroom and talking about literacy, but I think being able to really engage, empower, and create leaders in the community that, that has shown to have a huge impact, right, in some of these negative trends we're seeing um, in, in our Latino community. So can we find other ways, you know, to support some of these programs, whether we partner with Edu Futuro, who also does this kind of programming, or just help us expand that. I would love to, to see that more, because I think it will have a huge impact, especially um, in our younger students in elementary school, middle school, um, before they get into some of the comprehensive ESOL programs. So um, I really hope we can look at that and find ways to, to expand that. Okay. But thank sure. you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I just had a couple of comments and questions myself, which is um, I, I appreciate the focus on the English language learners. I think it's uh, clear we're doing a great deal, and I look forward to um, more of the data that you'll, you'll bring us but as um, that program gets uh, farther down the road. But I think it's, it's very heartening to see the number of credits that um, uh, the, the students um, earned in their first year in, in that program. I did wonder, do we break this down, or could we break it down by the students with interrupted learning? Um, I, I, we, we can. I, uh -huh. I, I, um, I, I think anecdotally, um, uh, we know that we uh, have a significant n more than we used to have, but is, is that true? Is that verifiable that we have more students so with interrupted So you'd li you like us to break down the information on our SIFE students okay. to show you how they've Okay, we can certainly do that. Okay, because mm -hmm. I, you know, I do think that 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 may be a factor in mm -hmm. in what in some of the um, trends mm -hmm. that we're seeing mm -hmm. there, and you know, something that we um, need to be cognizant of, particularly at the at the high school Absolutely. level. Absolutely, and that's um, a lot of reason why we put those social emotional supports in the pilots right. for those students who don't have that even understanding of being in a school. Let alone, don't talk about the instructional aspects. But talk about what just being literally in a school. Right. To be so in class, we certainly to go know from, that that is an issue know. and an area that we are working to support them on. So right. we can certainly look at giving you some more information on uh, pulling out the SIFE students and this data. Mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful to put, to put some of this into okay. context okay. and to also, you know, hopefully guide us in, in some of the things that we may need to, to do in the future. Okay. Um, I was really glad to see the, the comparison. Um, we'd been asking for it before, and I'm, I'm really glad to see the comparison of the. AP pass scores and the grades, which um, do seem to be um, pretty pretty darn consistent. I mean, there are, there are a few that uh, uh, get bad grades and still do well on the AP test, and and, and, and a handful that um, get high grades and not don't do so well. But generally speaking, it, it tracks. So I was I was very pleased to see that. And uh, and lastly, in the world languages, I would. Um, if, if this is the um, the goal report for it, for it to be um, looked at, the, our Vietnamese program, Vietnamese language program in Falls Church High School, I, I would be interested either offline or, or uh, as part of the work session to know how it's going. World languages is, is actually in strategy four, so we'll be coming back so with we'll some more information okay, on that. Then but I will, I it will is part of goal one, you're right, but not okay. in these two strategies. Because so. we talk about world language, mm -hmm. right. Uh, I, I think that uh, was a feather in our cap that you know mm -hmm. it was the first in Virginia and possibly still the only one in Virginia. So it'd be interesting to see how we do. Thank you so much for your very thorough report, and I'll look forward to having uh, the work session. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we next go to oh we next go to uh, student representative matters, and I call on Ms. Chu. 
Okay, so that's really hard to follow, but I'll try to keep this brief. Um, again, I'd just like to thank Dr. Duran because he actually came to our last Superintendent Student Advisory Council meeting and opened up a lot of opportunities for student engagement, which our students were very excited about. So thank you again for coming. Um, at this last student, rep um, sorry, student advocacy meeting, we also had a lot of interesting presentations from Leah Skirpsky and Jennifer Spears again. Thank you for coming to discuss mental health and wellness. Um, I would also just like to give a quick thank you to Fairfax High School. The students there raised over 2,500 cans in their Food for Others drive. Um, in addition, Edison had a very successful Got Hope Walkathon to raise awareness for suicide prevention. So in the spirit of the holidays, a lot of our students are mobilizing their leadership teams to create awareness events. So I'd just like to thank those two schools. Um, in addition, a lot of students are getting started on Just Ask Awareness events to increase awareness of human trafficking. Um, a lot of our students are working with local Girl Scout troops and working with other community members and organizations. So this is just one of the updates that we also had at our meeting. Finally, at this meeting, we discussed the Fairfax County Youth Survey with the student leaders. And there were a couple alarming statistics that we discovered from the youth survey. Um, in addition to there being large disparities between schools as to what were um, really prominent issues like substance abuse or um, teen sex trafficking, we noticed that there was a large increase in almost every category in high school um, from what I would call up underclassmen to upperclassmen ages. So from a jump from sophomore to junior to senior year, there was a huge increase in a lot of schools in categories such as um, alcohol consumption or um, substance abuse, uh, one of the biggest being texting and driving. Um, some of it we realized was a coming of age thing, some part of it being uh, more independence as an older student, but a lot of students were alarmed to find that as students get older, um, the, the extent to which the issues are prominent in our student community is just greater and greater. So something we notice a lot of seniors are facing big issues. So we're working on ways to try to increase awareness um, in our student bodies about being a mature and responsible community member and refraining from that kind of use. Um, again, one of the biggest surprises to us was texting and driving. We noticed that a lot of schools, the biggest issue was texting and driving. Um, and especially in seniors and juniors, students aren't aware yet of the repercussions of that. So some students had ideas about working with local organizations to get a car or a, another vehicle that has been damaged by a texting and driving case and putting it in front of a school, showing students what the effects of texting and driving is. So a lot of our students are getting started on these projects already, so it's a very exciting um, endeavor from the results of that meeting. Um, so again, uh, we saw a lot of, of work to be done from the Fairfax County Youth Survey, but a lot of student groups are already getting started and are reaching out to the community to improve our, our students' uh, lifestyles. So that's all I have, and I hope every student has a very healthy, safe, but joyous holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you, Ms. Chu. Uh, Confirmation of action taken in closed meeting. This is the portion of the meeting where the board will confirm any action regarding issues that were discussed in the closed meeting. These issues may include action taken regarding student disciplinary matters. Board members have discussed each individual case and at this time will make several motions to confirm the recommended action. And I call on um, uh, Ms. Schultz for a motion. I move to excuse from attendance at school certain students identified in closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code section 22.1-254B1. Second by, um, is there a second? Seconded by Mrs. Huff. All those in favor? That's unanimous and that passes. I call on Mrs. Strauss for a motion. Thank you. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who distributed evil, illegal drugs to another student at school and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Darnett Kopex. All those in favor? That is unanimous. That motion passes. I call on Mr. Moon for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the school would authorize legal counsel to settle the potential litigation according to the terms and conditions discussed in closed session. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Palchik. All those in favor? 
uh, Hines, Palchik, Strauss, Evans, Moon, and McElveen. All those opposed? Schultz and Derenek Kofax. All those abstaining? Uh, Huff. And that motion passes. I call on Ms. Hines for a motion. I, <clears throat> I move to accept the recommendation of the hearing officer regarding the employee identified in closed meeting and to authorize the chairman to notify the employee by letter of the board's decision. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Ms. Schultz. All those in favor? Hines, Palchik, Huff, Schultz, Strauss, Evans, Moon, McElveen. All those opposed? All those abstaining? Dearnack, Kofax. That motion passes. I call on uh, Mrs. Schultz for a motion. Madam Chair, I move the school board grant the grievability appeal of the employee discussed in the closed session. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Moon. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. That motion passes. Item 4.02, FY 2017 Mid-Year Budget Review. I call on Ms. Darnack Kofax for a motion. I move that the school board approve revenue and expenditure changes reflected in the FY 2017 Mid-Year Budget Review as detailed in the agenda item. Second. 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 Seconded by Mr. Moon. Uh, Ms. Darnack Kofax, would you like to speak to your motion? Just very briefly, um, we had presentations and this was discussed in a work session. Um, the mid-year funds that are available, um, we, um, uh, there had been some consensus that the work session to set aside is, is the beginning balance and um, there is opportunity um, in the future to change this um, should we desire and um, that's my only comment. Mr. Moon, would you like to speak to your Nothing more to add. All right. Um, I see no other lights on, so uh, with that, I will take a vote on um, uh, the motion to um, have the school board approve revenue and expenditure changes reflected in the FY 2017 mid-year budget review as detailed in the agenda item. All those in favor, raise your hand. And that vote is unanimous. That motion passes. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval by the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. Five point zero one approve the minutes of the December first, two thousand sixteen regular school board meeting. Five point zero two appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. Five point zero three award a contract for the Waynewood Elementary School renovation and additions project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Dustin Construction Inc. in the amount of seventeen million three hundred and eighty two thousand dollars and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 5.04, award the contract for the chiller replacement at Waples Mill Elementary School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Boiler and Furnace Cleaners, Inc., Hurley Company Division in the amount of $267,500 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. And 5.05, .05, confirm the separations for the period beginning November 1, 2016 and ending November 30, 2016. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. We now turn to new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote on these items tonight, but action is scheduled for a future meeting. 6.01, approve the FY 2018 to 2022 capital improvement program. 6.02, approve the strategic plan goal one student success 
success strategies one and two as detailed in the agenda item. And now we turn to Superintendent Matters. I call on Dr. Lockhart. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I want to uh, start by thanking the members of the Budget Task Force uh, who have agreed to reconvene this year. As we face another fiscal challenge in FY18, the task force held their first meeting this past week and began their work. As everyone's aware, the aim there is to uh, have refreshed and any new recommendations ready for our budget work session on January 23rd. So we appreciate all who are uh, on the budget task force and supporting us in that work. With the winter weather rapidly approaching, I want to remind everyone that there are a number of ways you can receive our late opening, early closing, and cancellation information. I'm sure everybody already has those all programmed in and ready to go, but um, we did recently send a message uh, home with those details, so please make sure you're ready as it, uh, it's, it's crept right up upon us here. Um, we do try to make decisions as early as we can, but sometimes Mother Nature does not always cooperate, so be ready. Finally, I would like to say, as we approach uh, the season here, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and the happiest of holidays to everyone. To the members of our school board, I hope you all have some time to unplug and unwind and enjoy time with your family and some much needed uh, rest and relaxation. And certainly to our staff, administrators, principals, teachers, our students and their families, um, hope that they can find that much needed time too, to take a break uh, enjoy the company of, e of each other over the holidays and, and recharge. I'm appreciative of all that uh, all of those folks do for our school community. And uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Dr. Lockhart. I will now have board reports and I call on Ms. Darnett Koufax uh, for a report on the SKIPS committee. Um, on the SKIPS, the su SKIP stands for Successful Children and Youth Policy Team. And we met on December 7th. We had a very full agenda. Uh, we first discussed um, the SKIPS response to um, Sharon Bulova's directive um, for how to move forward on agenda items that our two boards agreed upon when we held our joint retreat earlier this year. Um, there was also discussion on the proposal. Um, Supervisor Harity had put forward um, something on reinstituting um, school-based drug counselor programs, and that was discussed. And finally, there was discussion about potential implications on school and county programs given the ballot failure of the meals tax, and we had a brief discussion on how, there, how other local um, governments access um, throughout the country access and dedicate funding to children's services. Um, Madam Chair, since I always forget to ask you this, I'm going to ask you this in public, that I think the the breadth and depth of what's happening at SKIPS is important, um, and I think at some point I would like to have a work session scheduled um, in the coming years, so I just ask you that now. All right, we will put that on the list. Thank you so much, Mr. Darren Um Ms. Hines, I call on, um, Ms. Hines for a report on the audit committee meeting of December 14th. Okay, thank you. Um, I would mention that uh, the school board had an audit work session this past Monday, the 12th as well, um, where uh, we talked about the um, auditor general search process and also got some feedback from school board members on proposed audit plan amendments for the um, 2017 audit plan. Uh, then the audit committee did have a work session last night on the 14th. We received a report of the local school activity funds audit. Um, we began our review of regulation 1420, which is the audit charter. We reviewed the audit plan amendments, um, again, in light of school board input from Monday night. And we did make some prog progress on our uh, auditor general search proposal. Thank you. I call on um, Mrs. Strauss for a report on our forum tonight. Yes, thank you. We did hold a forum this evening, uh, and we considered two topics. One was revising the length of terms for the School Health Advisory Committee appointees. We decided to refer this to the um, Governance Committee to see whether or not uh, uh, we would accept the recommendation from the committee to have these appointments, the citizen appointments of the committee to be two years instead of one. The agreement was to consider it at governance. We also discussed the, um, whether or not the school board should review the policy 8335. This is the policy 
that um, uh, governs uh, our policy regarding cell towers on school board property. And it has been 10 years since we've adopted this pro policy. Uh, and we decided to also refer this to governance to f for further discussion to see if there should be uh, any changes to the policy uh, in light of the fact that uh, there have been changes in technology, uh, fees, uh, various community concerns, et cetera. So uh, we did refer both of these items to governance for further discussion and for uh, possible recommendations that would come back to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now go to board matters and I call on Ms. Hines to start us off. Oh, <coughs> surprise. Thank you. Um, well, I don't have much to say. It's late. We've had a busy and um, really useful meeting. I would just say happy holidays to everyone. Um, and um, uh, I, I hope that you all have a safe and enjoyable time. See you uh, next year. Ms. Patrick. Yes, a few quick things, highlights. Uh, I was able to go back to Providence Elementary School to meet with new principal Phillips. Always fun to visit them and their STEM labs. Um, had another advisory council meeting here at Luther Jackson Middle School and it's very exciting to get to hear from students um, what's working, what they'd like to improve in their um, programs. And finally, I had my second meeting this year with PTA, PTSA and PTO boards this past weekend. Um, always a really lively, insightful, and a lot of camaraderie in sharing experiences. Uh, we had board members who talked about the youth mental health first aid training, which they found very helpful, um, as well as the opening of the pantry at Oakton High School. That's been a huge success. Um, and finally, talking about the budget task force. So um, I do hope that people will be engaged in the processes here, and thank you. Um, to Dr. Lockhart for re-engaging the task force. I think it would be a great way for us to have that community conversation. Um, and finally, this year is one of those times when uh, Hanukkah does fall on Christmas Eve. And so it's a true uh, happy Chris <laughs> Um I hope all will be enjoying celebrating and staying warm. Um, and um, thank you to the MPOs who um, helped out when the Sunday school teacher was stuck and you guys were there to help. So appreciate everything you do for us every day and uh, happy holiday and please stay safe and warm out there. Thank you. Mrs. Huff. Pass, thank you. Mrs. Michelle. Um, a couple, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I have a few things. Um, uh, first of all, I wanna um, thank the um, members of the host committee at Jill's house um, for inviting me. Uh, it was a awesome experience to go to their winter fundraiser. Uh, this is a, a house that's really unlike anything almost in the country that aids um, young, uh, young students with intellectual disabilities, often profound intellectual disabilities, and um, provides families respite. Um, and it was a very amazing experience. I know that um, a, a number of the NICU nurses that I know uh, volunteer their time there for students who are um, more medically severely disabled and um, I'm profoundly grateful for that opportunity. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to Wes Springfield who had a very challenging uh, week this week with a water main break uh, that um, Mr. Plattenberg's still here. Um, uh, congratulations to Principal Mukai, all of the staff in the building, the students. Um, I think that this was a in-person, uh, live, uh, on the ground um, training run for developing <laughs> resilience and grit um, in life because you never know what's going to happen. Um, water main breaks happen to you know corporations and and homeowners, and they they got a, a splash of adulthood. Um, actually, no splash, there was no water. Uh, but uh, terrific working um, across FCPS, all the staff, all the students, and all the parents, and um, I'm really grateful for the outcome there. Uh, I wanna give a shout out also to West Springfield for their Buddies Club, um, who had their uh, winter gathering um, yesterday and um, put together a presence for kids. It was just an, uh, an amazing um, event. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend, but I got reports of it. Um, Centerville High School, Mr. Jagels, your um, mannequin challenge video 
um, is awesome at making its rounds. Uh, I also want to say to Robinson, um, good luck in Beast of the East. Your wrestling team is headed to the University of Delaware this weekend, which is one of the largest wrestling tournaments on the East Coast. And one particular wrestler in, in, um, is get in, getting my shout out. And Wes Fields, um, I know you're here and I'm sorry that I'm jumping in line, but again, double, double overtime, state champion 6A, Oscar Smith, um, what an amazing game. So congratulations for that. Um, lastly, this is um, a, a call out to our ultimately profoundly talented uh, bands in all of our high schools. Um, the reports that are uh, reverberating across the region of uh, schools in DC not showing up for filling out applications for a presidential inauguration are frankly um, uh, utterly disheartening to me. And we have such profound talent in, you know, band after band in all of our high schools that what an amazing opportunity for us to showcase to um, not only this region, but the nation, um, how we do uh, fine and performing arts in Fairfax County. And so I, I really hope that many of the band directors in the schools take advantage of this as an um, opportunity that lays bare at our feet um, to highlight uh, the amazing, um, not only music educators, but uh, the students and their talent. So I look forward to you taking advantage of that. Thank you. Mrs. Strauss. I want to congratulate Chris Johnston, who is a music and computer, si and computer science teacher at Fairfax Academy. Chris has, for the third time in a row, been nominated for Music Educator of the Year. This is by the Grammy Award. It's a national award. Uh, Chris also conducts the symphony orchestras in Northern Virginia Community College. He often premieres student works. They do a lot of composing in his classes. Chris also prepares and conducts the Cappies Gala Orchestra for our Kennedy Center Gala each spring. He is a very, very talented gentleman and dedicated to our children. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Everybody have a wonderful vacation. It's not cold enough here, I'm going to Canada <laughs> where it's even colder. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Moon. Well, Mrs. Strauss, come back safely. Uh, Last few days, uh, I was able to enjoy uh, music and arts and you know, programs of many of our students. I went to South County a Secondary School last night to uh, listen to the Winter Choral Concert. A lot of great seasonal music. And uh, actually, that was two days ago. Yes, because yesterday I was in Mosby Woods Elementary School where Fairfax Academy's dance students you know, performed twice yesterday, you know, showcasing the you know, Nutcracker for the young students. It was great for the older ones to show what the younger, ca younger ones can do in the future as they grow up and learn art, art programs through uh, our school system. But the most exciting thing that happened to me uh, in the last couple of weeks was nothing other than actually being at the game, Westfield beating Oscar Smith two years in a row, for two years in a row, this time only a second of all time, not third of all time, Westfield stopped Oscar Smith at the one yard line for ch state championship. It was worth 170 miles one way <laughs> trip. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Okay, um, I'd just like to say thank you to Mr. Moon for going to watch Westfield. Uh, and I would like to also uh, jump on the bandwagon and, and, and point out as a, as a, it seems like a very long time ago, a high school football player, um, what an accomplishment it is to win the state championship at the highest level of high school football in Virginia. It's really a testimony to uh, the, the fortitude of those kids and the, and the dedication of the, of the coaches uh, involved in, in, in that uh, operation that they got over there. It's a bit of a dynasty, I think, at this point. Um, <clears throat> so congratulations again to them. Uh, now you've set the standard, and the basketball team has to win a second <laughs> state championship also. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, 
uh, thank you to everybody who came out to office hours uh, recently that I recently held. It was a, it was great to meet people and to hear hear directly from uh, the parents uh, in my communities. Uh, I will be having office hours again uh, after the new year. It's tentatively scheduled for the first of February. And then lastly, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues here on the board. Uh, at the end of a first year, I appreciate everybody's collegiality and welcome me to, welcoming me to the board. I've learned a tremendous amount just in 12 months. Uh, and and I, I appreciate and look forward to working with everyone next year. Uh, so Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and have a wonderful holiday with your families. Thanks. Darren Kopik. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, I had the pleasure of going to several schools, um, having visits over the last few weeks, meeting with teachers and the principals and students at Mount Vernon High School, at Quandra Road School, and at Hayfield High School. Um, I also was able to enjoy some musical performances. Um, they happened to be at Edison High School, where I happened to know a student there pretty well. Um, they, but Edison High School had two days of musical performances where they hosted a high school from Australia, and the two schools, com those two schools combined their band, orchestra, and chorus, and they performed um, both holiday and regular music programs together over two, ni over two nights, and it was wonderful. Um, I also checked into the budget task force meeting this week, um, and I do want to thank all of those who are volunteering your time um, for Dr. Lockhart's task force. Um, we realize we're asking a lot of you, and we're and it's going to take you some time. But we we thank you for participating so much. Um, I also, we, this week, we also welcomed a new cohort of student leaders, so we're looking um, forward to working with all of you. Yesterday, I was honored to speak to Girl Scout Troop 1444 on civic engagement, and um, this was a bunch of fourth graders from Rose Hill and Bush Hill Elementary Schools, and they were a very engaged group that asked a lot of thoughtful questions, and thank you, ladies, for inviting me. And finally, um, I would like to say happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah to every, all our students, teachers, staff out there. Um, have a joyful and restful break and come back renewed in 2017. Mr. McElveen. So as we conclude this very long uh, meeting tonight after this very long year, I want to wish all of my colleagues um, a wonderful holiday season and a wonderful 2017. And um, I hope this, this, the length of this meeting does not portend um, <laughs> bad news for this coming year, but I know we'll be spending a lot of hours together, um, hopefully not, not driving through the countryside um, at 100 miles an hour this time, but um, I hope we all do well together in 2017. Thank you, and I too want to thank my colleagues for um, all their work this year and uh, wish everybody um, in our community and on the board and certainly our wonderful staff a happy holidays and uh, have a restful break and a wonderful new year. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>